get started. Good evening, welcome. Welcome to our community members who are joining us via the YouTube live stream. I'm Jen, I'm Jen, yes, I am Jen Westmoreland Bouchard, Hopkins School Board <laughs> Chair, and i um, like to welcome you to our workshop this evening. Our first item on the agenda is an exciting one. Um, we're so grateful to have student, scholar, board representatives, um, who join us in our board and committee work. And so to give us an update on that program, I will turn it over to Director Peterson. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. Um, yeah, the idea tonight, just very casually, is to get an opportunity for um, us to meet Oscar. Um, he did attend previously, but um, we didn't really do the traditional ask a question and really get to know each other. Um, and I did not, I apologize in advance, I did not bring the slumber party cards tonight. Oh, no. To really, I know, to really beef up, beef up our efforts on that one. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't think of a question for all of us to answer so that Oscar can really get to know us on a more personal level. So I think what I'm going to ask everyone tonight is um, if you could be any type of of animal, oh, no. No. <laughs> what would it be and why? And I'll start with you, Director Cool. Definitely an alligator. Oh. Mm -hmm. Because they're cool. Because why? they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> My thoughts. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I, I think, like, I go back and forth between cat and dog because I'm really social and I like to be around people, but I think I'm gonna go with cat because they, I think, sleep a lot more and in general tend to have a much lazier lifestyle. So I'm gonna go with a cat, like a house cat, a very pampered one, like Fancy Feast house cat. <laughs> fancy. <laughs> I, ha I have a very vivid image in my mind of the cat that you would be now. Good, I yeah. hope it involves a rhinestone collar. Okay. No. Director Adams. My turn. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, trial by immersion here. Um, a bear. Oh. I think bears are so cool. Okay. I like to like to be one, and they get to sleep all winter. They do. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. good point. Like a grizzly or a. Black? Oh yeah. Is there a no bull? black black bear? <laughs> mm -hmm. He likes Minnesota so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Dr. Mary Perry Reed. I feel like this is a common answer, but I would love to be a dolphin. Mm. They're like mm. smooth and sleek, and they just like, just ease so fluidly through the smooth or choppy waters. That'd be pretty cool. Mm. All right. See, I like, uh, you learn so much about people. Mm -hmm. Chair Bouchard. Um, I would be a bird, and I can't um, decide which bird. I mean, like, definitely a flying bird, not like a... A bird of prey? No, oh, no. I don't, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think I could handle raptor. that. Um, like, not like a chicken, but a, a bird that flies, um, because they have a really unique perspective Ooh. on the world. <clears throat> All right. Vice Chair Andreessen. I would be a wolf because they're, I don't know. I've just always liked wolves. <laughs> I often see them as solitary, even though they're pack animals, so, huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Director Kahn. Um, I really like um, snowy white owls. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're just very majestic and they look smart, <laughs> that's about <laughs> it. Excellent. And we are so lucky to have Grace with us as well. Grace is our new sophomore rep. Um, okay, so Oscar, I'm going to ask you the animal question, but I would also love you to just give the board just a quick bio on yourself, your grade, your background, anything that feels pertinent to you. I would be a monkey. Okay. For sure. Um, and my background, I'm a junior. I've been very involved in theater. I've been involved in track and field. I'm involved with the JSU and DECA. Um, I enjoy school a lot, and I really like this community, and it's an honor to be here. Thank you. 
All right, you missed kind of the beginning, but we're making everybody decide what animal, if they could be an animal, what animal would they be and why? And then for you, just a quick little blurb on yourself. Um, I'm getting in front of the microphone. Um, if I was an animal, I would most likely be some form of like water creature, I would say. Um, like an alligator? <laughs> or like a dolphin. <laughs> we already have an alligator and a dolphin at the table, Grace. So they want to know, like, are you going to hang out with them? Trying to see what side them? of the fence you're going to be on. <laughs> Let's go for a seahorse. Ooh. Ooh. I like it. Um, so I'm, I'm Grace. I'm a sophomore. Um, I did theater last year with Oscar. Um, and then this year... I'm doing um, Girls United, this obviously, um, and then I'm, ooh, excuse me, <clears throat> um, and then I'm just kind of going to school. I have a job at Patina, if any of you guys have been there. Um, that keeps me pretty busy. Um, yeah, I enjoy school. I'm in ceramics right now, which is pretty fun and having a good time. Awesome. And Amani, you're totally not off the hook with the animal question. <laughs> I know you thought you were, but you're not. <laughs> okay, I would probably be a turtle. I mean, I genuinely really like turtles, but like having my ho my own house on my back would be so convenient. And <laughs> <laughs> I think life moving at that pace, like slow, would be good, especially now. And yeah. I dig that. That's good. All right, so just a little intro to you guys. Um, so I know, Grace, before you were here, we kind of did an intro of the people at the table, but I'll let you, we'll just do that again really quickly, even though we have our, our name tags. I figure we can at least introduce ourselves to you. I am John Cool. I have a daughter that's a junior, Jordan. And you have a son too, don't you? I do, but he doesn't count. His name is Zeke. <laughs> He's 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow, don't get on John's bad side. So I know I've met you, Grace, but I'm Katie Peterson, um, and I have a fourth and fifth grader at Meadowbrook. Steve Adams. I'm, I've got two grown children, both of whom went through the entire uh, Hopkins School District, starting at Tanglin, and then at North, and then at the high school. I'm uh, Dr. Reed, Mary Peary Reed, and I have a fourth grader at Xingxing, an eighth grader at North, and this is year five in my role. Hi, Grace. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. <laughs> I'm Jen, and I have a fifth grader at Xingxing, and really glad to have you with us. Hi, Grace. I'm Shannon Andreessen. I have a eighth grader at West Junior High and a recent Hopkins High School grad. Hi, Grace. Um, my name is Tanya Khan. Um, my daughter graduated from Hopkins High School in 2018. Currently, she's a junior at the University of Minnesota. And my son graduated um, last year. He is also going to the University of Minnesota. That's it. Awesome. So we really appreciate the time and energy that all of you guys put in to your board rep positions. Um, and, you know, if there are questions that you have for us or anything more that, you know, we can do to help clarify or anything to support you in your work, you just have to let us know. All right. Thank you. So it looks like in the board packet um, it, for the workshop, it links to a doc that has committee assignments for the student board reps, and it looks like the assignments are either done or well underway. Mm -hmm. Where are we at with that, Imani? Okay, so we do have one board rep who does online school. So she's not on here yet on the committee assignments, but she's going to sign up. Um, but we had a lot of popularity with the cities, cities and board steering committee, as you can see, so there's three people in there and uh, we have two. Okay, do you want me to say the people in the committees? Sure, we can take a look at the, at the doc too. Okay, 
So in the Cities and Board Steering Committee, we have Isabella, who's a junior, Parker, who's a senior, and Elif, who's a sophomore. In the Legislative Action Coalition, we have me, Elif, and Oscar. In the Educational Services Advisory Committee, we have Elif. In the Schools and Communities in Partnership, we have Angel, who's a senior, Grace, and Isabella. In the Community Education Advisory Council, we have me. No one is in Special Education Advisory Committee yet. No one is in Citizens Financial Advisory Council. And in the Policy and Monitoring Committee, Parker was interested in that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um for committing to that committee work. Um, I know it's really valuable to have, have you there and have your voices in those rooms because so much of our board work happens in committee and then those recommendations are brought before the full board. So um, it's so important to have student voice in those spaces. So really appreciate um, your organizational work and, and the commitment of our student board reps. Great. Any um, questions or comments from my board colleagues for our fabulous student board reps? Okay, well, we'll move to our next agenda item on the workshop, and that is our ESSER budget update. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Mary Peary Reed. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. I'm just going to show two slides for the framing and then our Director of Business Services will also help with this report. So I'm just gonna wait for this to turn on here. Are there any magic tricks with this thing? Oh no, it's kinda of slow, huh? Oh, oh, it wanted us to literally oh, hard. touch there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow, okay. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about, oh, we're first going to wait for the slide. <laughs> oh, oh, there, there we go. go. Oh, so you guys sorry. can do it. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Apparently there are several steps you do have to follow in order for your slide to project. All active. Your drink's gonna spill. Oops, <laughs> Rhoda. Oh. Is there a way to start this portion of the meeting over? Right, no, it's fine. We've all been there. It's just a workshop. <laughs> Workshops are casual. <laughs> I wonder, should we try the, um, I have a the Apple TV thing? Which Apple TV thing? Hey, oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry. Well, thanks, Tanya. Yeah. Do we have an agenda that we're going off of that could be shared? Uh, yeah, let me show Is you. Is there more to this than just this? No. We're going to go through that whole box. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll Thank hide you. it under good. here. Yeah, I'll take it. Oh. <laughs> This is such an exciting uh, workshop already. already. <laughs> Spilled water, several hands at the table, all hands on deck. Okay. Are we okay to start? Yes. Okay, very good. So um, we want to provide an update to our school board and also our any community members listening in or watching later um, around our use of ESSER funds. And um, I wanted to start by sharing that we had our instructional data scientist review a lot of the survey data from all of our surveys last school year. Here we go. To look at what families, parents, scholars, and staff we're saying um, were important for school, for learning, for support, especially during a pandemic year and given that we are still in the thick of COVID, what might ongoing or different support look like? And so um, 
thanks to Dr. Holm, we actually have a 10-page report, um, and this is just a summary of it, that we reviewed as a leadership teams, so our principals, our cabinet leaders, to just look at the qualitative data that came from our families, and you can see sort of a summary of um, the just high level, um, some glance at um, how many people responded to, especially we looked at the a comprehensive survey that was sent out in May 2021 to staff, families, and students. And so she engaged in what she called a rigorous and accelerated data reduction to review more than 10,000 pieces of qualitative feedback to identify salient themes that we could use to inform our decisions. Because what we're asking is, um, you know, what what's important to our students and families and staff about teaching and learning and the support needed for teaching and learning, especially in a pandemic year with uh, physical safety, medical safety, psychological safety, um, wellness, um, responsiveness to unique student learning needs, um, different curriculum and pedagogy needs that teachers might have, um, things that leaders might also need to really support their schools. And so um, here are just super high level themes that came out of all of that data about what families are seeking as they send their students to school, what's, what matters most to staff, what scholars believe needs to be true about their learning or what they learned about themselves as learners, um, and programmatically, what are some components to learning that families, students, and staff might be interested in. For example, continuing um, a distance learning option for families. And so a significant portion of our ESSER dollars are being used to fund our Hopkins Online uh, Royal Learning Academy. Um, we also have outdoor immersion at Gatewood, increased Spanish immersion to be responsive to um, those desires for families. And um, it was just really interesting for all of us to review this data and to really use it to inform our thinking to, um, to better understand what the people that we serve are hoping for or are looking for. So um, you'll note um, with the, on the second bullet point there, staff, what matters mo most. Um, I don't know why this keeps going in and out, but take a look at empathy, student well-being, students being well-served um, in terms of their nutrition and physical needs teachers and staff being a part of strong teams, providing emotional support to teachers and staff. So these are the kinds of things that um, really helped us with our thinking as we asked ourselves, well, what would be a, a, a responsible and responsive way of leveraging these funds that came from the federal government? So with that, I'd like to just turn it over to um, Director Chapinduka, our business services director. Um, let's see. I used to know how to use this thing before we <laughs> switched our model to Google Meets. Remember, we always had to present from here? Yeah. And now I feel like I'm a novice. So I'd like to introduce Tarira Chapinduka, who will um, provide some additional information, and then we'll see um, what questions board members have. Tarira, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, wonderful. Good evening, Dr. Samir Pirid. Uh, good evening, Dr. Bouchard. Good evening, respective uh, board members, the community. Uh, what I'll do here, I'll go ahead and uh, uh, present my screen. So just give me a second here. Okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Just give me a second there. Because audio is better, scanner is better. 
Oh, I got a new computer. Oh. <laughs> I, just, I, I just said to Director Cool, I think they upgraded his gear finally. Your your picture's better, your audio's better. Oh, you, you look you. great. <laughs> You've, he's always looked great. Yeah. Okay, so I'm trying to expand my... Perfect, that looks good. Okay, you guys can see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so what I'll do here is uh, actually for, uh, for those who are actually not familiar with uh, uh, with the acronomy uh, ESA, uh, what I would do? Let's a second, yeah. Okay, so what I would do is I'll probably give the full definition of the uh, of the term uh, for those who are not familiar with that acronym uh, ESA, with the elementary and secondary school emergency relief. Uh, so with three pots of money which we received from uh, from the federal government, uh, we started with the CARES Act, which was the ESA-1 funds, which also included the GEAR and the Coronavirus Relief Funds. Uh, those uh, amounts were enacted on March 27 of uh, 2020, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, and those funds are supposed to be uh, spent by September 30th of 2022. Uh, the next pot of money was the ESA-2, uh, which we actually got awarded in December of 2020, to be particular December 27th of 2020, and those uh, dollars are supposed to be spent by September 30th of 2023. And then the third pot of money is the ESA-3 through the ARP, which is the American Rescue Plan. Uh, those funds were awarded uh, on March 11, 2021 and we are supposed to spend those dollars by September 30th of 2024. So those are the three pots of money we'll be talking about here uh, in a nutshell. Uh, what we have uh, actually- Director Chapanduka? Sure. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Two things. Is there a way you might share the report with the board members so they can see it more closely? And also, is there a way and I don't know, um, Elise, do you have access to it where you could share it? Maybe you share it with Elise and she can share it with the board members. And then also, can you just share, um, or can you present your slide deck so we can see the the entirety of each slide, please? Okay, just, just give me a second Thank here. you, sorry to interrupt. Yes. That's a lot better. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. Yes. Yes, yes thank you. Because I can't see it now, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, no. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. I mean, I, I hope you guys are seeing the slide I'm on. Are you guys seeing the What is ESA slide? Yes. 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 Okay, all right. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll continue, uh, having given that context. So the first part of mine, which I explained, being the ESA, ESA one, and again, I'll, I'll send out the, uh, the, the slide deck to you guys. Uh, the ESA one, so we received uh, ESA one, which was actually divided into uh, three pots of money. Uh, there was the ESA one, 90%, which was $725,820. Uh, we had the ESA one, 9.5%, which was the $143,252. Then we had the gear, which was $136,295. And 
And then we had the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which was the $1,966,929 for a total of $2,972,196. So the majority of these funds have already been expended uh, in fiscal year 21. Uh, what I would say about these funds, uh, these funds were, uh, were more focused on, uh, focused on survival. Uh, we're in survival mode with the pandemic, so we used most of these funds for personal protective equipment. Uh, we used these funds for ventilation upgrades. Uh, we used these funds for additional technology since we were in distance learning and hybrid learning, so a lot of it was used to buy gadgets for our scholars and staff. Uh, and so use these funds to fund positions to support the hybrid and uh, distance learning. So, uh, for, so the, the, the majority of these funds were used for those, including some of the summer, uh, summer learning experiences. So just alluding to what the superintendent uh, mentioned in the surveys, so our next pot of money was the uh, ESA 2. Uh, the total amount for this was 2,686,653. And the ESA 2, uh, based on state guidance, uh, we are able for use to address academic support among students, uh, which included administering and using reliable assessments to assess students' academic uh, progress, uh, as well as implementing evidence-based activities. <coughs> they were also allowable for use to address uh, school facility repairs and uh, improvements as well as uh, inspection, testing, maintenance, repair, replacement, and uh, upgrading projects to improve the indoor air quality in school facilities. Uh, so those were some of the general guidance of how those dollars were, uh, uh, were supposed to be used based on uh, the state's uh, uh, guide for, for allowable use of those funds. Uh, so, uh, on the next slide, uh, we are showing you how those funds were allocated uh, based on Hopkins priorities. So, uh, the initial $1,241,172 was allocated to address uh, and fund all counselors in our buildings, uh, so as to address some of the uh, social emotional learning and uh, uh, the mental health needs of our scholars. <clears throat> we allocated uh, about $145,400 uh, to special services for addressing some of their critical needs within special services department. We allocated 46,997,000 to uh, District 287 uh, for the world, uh, which is our alternative program. And we are supposed to do that based on uh, the scholars who are actually uh, residing out of uh, Hopkins, but attending that program at uh, District 287. Uh, the rest, which is $1,253,084.48, was allocated to buildings uh, based on uh, enrollment. So we did a, a basic per student calculation uh, and allocated those dollars for uh, different initiatives and uh, innovation ideas uh, as uh, guided by building principles. So I would actually uh, mention that uh, we are more in the stability uh, stage of our, our process. So the ESA one, we're more like we're in survival mode uh, SR2, we are more in the stability. So some of the uh, initiatives which have been brought to the table, uh, which uh, buildings are working on using those ESA funds, uh, uh, things like uh, the building instructional leadership team uh, and uh, collaboration within those spaces. So they are using some of those funds for that. Uh, direct teacher and classroom mental health support through uh, related services. Uh, they are also funding some of their 
additional instructional pairs to support classrooms. Uh, they are also using some of those funds to hire teachers for credit recovery, uh, field trips and partnerships with community, uh, uh, increase collaboration time for teachers, uh, fees associated with concurrent enrollment so that we offer more college credits, uh, community design standards and curriculum, as well as uh, some after school uh, evening mentoring. So those are some of the initiatives which have been uh, brought by uh, building leaders in collaboration with their staff in the community and uh, are thankful to the ESA $2 they are actually funding those. So uh, uh, in a nutshell, the ESA 2, the whole entire $2.686 million has been allocated into buildings. None of that has gone into any department. All those dollars have gone into the buildings apart from uh, the small portion which we have to give to District uh, 287 as well as some of those support initiatives uh, in special services. Then uh, ESA 3, uh, so again, uh, based on the uh, guidance from, uh, from the state, uh, ESA 3 uh, allowed board to expand full service community schools uh, that provide wraparound services to students and their families, uh, expand access to tutoring, and these are just general guidance, and then go into the criteria we have used uh, at Hopkins on identifying what we need to prioritize with those dollars. Uh, increased student support personnel, things like counselors, which we have already done with some of our ESA $2, uh, teacher recruitment and retention, including teachers of color and indigenous teachers, expand language access for families who do not speak English as a first language, expand rigorous coursework, uh, such as advanced placement, uh, IB career programs, uh, career and technical education, uh, develop, implement, and maintain an eth uh, ethnic and indigenous education studies curriculum, uh, field trips and uh, hands on learning experience, expanding after school activities and summer learning opportunities. So, as a, uh, as a system, uh, we convert uh, a number of meetings with uh, a lot of our building and department leaders uh, to identify uh, how the SR3 were going to uh, to be used. And we did use a spending criteria and our spending criteria for SR3 was that any initiatives uh, for using those dollars must be driven uh, by the uh, Vision 2031 and must be a driver to launch us close to Vision 2031. Uh, those initiatives should focus on skill capacity building and must be sustainable. <laughs> the initiatives must align with and support or enhance instructional priorities, including personalized learning, concept in inquiry based learning, restorative practice, practices, and uh, social emotional learning as well as uh, following a criteria which we researched on uh, based on the Christensen Institute. So, um, so at this point in time, our ESA $3 are actually divided into two, uh, two different components. Uh, we have uh, the 80% allocations, which is $4,827,073.67. And we have the 20% loss of learning allocation, which is $1,206,768. To give us a total of $6,033,841.67. And uh, we just completed uh, the application to um, so the Department of Education. Uh, uh, these dollars are actually supposed to be used for those specific priorities. Uh, which have been guided by the state and in the application uh, we did give the state the plan uh, and how we're going to address uh, some of the uh, needs in our buildings as well as uh, the general framework of um, what they define is uh, loss of learning. 
So currently out of the $6,033,841, which, uh, which uh, it, the district has been allocated, uh, we've uh, earmarked $2 million uh, for the Hopkins Online Learning Academy. Uh, we have also put a set aside of $250,000 to support the uh, secondary Friday flex schedule. And uh, we also have $105,450, which is an allocation to dist uh, District 287 uh, for the world program uh, due to, you know, the students who attend that program and uh, are having an obligation to share the funds with them. So the remaining uh, $3,678,291 and 67 cents uh, have been uh, actually put on uh, at the table and we are trying to identify and prioritize uh, based on uh, innovations uh, which will actually make us get closer to uh, our vision 2031. So some of the initiatives which have been tabled which we are still in conversation uh, and will be actually meeting again to identify the priorities for this year and then uh, what we'll do uh, the following year with the remaining dollars. Uh, I've mentioned about the online academy, which we have uh, uh, funded, as well as the secondary flexible Fridays. <clears throat> uh, the other components which have been put on the table uh, include initiatives to improve the recruitment of teachers and staff of color, uh, stipends for staff to help them with school feedback, uh, language translations district-wide, uh, additional family license, hiring incentives for paraprofessional, uh, mostly in special education, and other hard-to-fill roles, uh, free year-round parks programs, youth scholarships for enrichment programs, after-school evening mentoring, pay incentive, uh, pay incentives to high school students for supporting elementary classroom staff, blended learning spaces uh, transformation, outdoor learning spaces, develop a framework for restorative practices and conflict resolution, uh, some of the PPE, ventilation and uh, technological requirements we still need, just considering that we are still in a, in a pandemic. Uh, but those are some of the uh, ideas which have been tabled, which we are working on and trying to operationalize and make sure that they uh, become part and uh, parcel of uh, our strategy for this year, going into next year and uh, in the long run uh, into into the future of our, our vision. With that, uh, I will take any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Chapanduka. And if you could share um, the slide deck with Elise and then she can share it with us so we can click in on some of those, those links and go a little bit deeper, that would be really helpful. Wondering if my board colleagues have any questions. Chair Bouchard. Yes, Director Adams. Uh, <clears throat> Terrero, I was, I was wondering how are we going to determine priorities for the, the final 3.6 million? Who's going to be making the decision on how those those dollars get spent? Uh, thank you for that, uh, Director Adams, and I also have the superintendent chime in on this. So, so so far we've uh, held about three, uh, three uh, uh, what I would call staff uh, public sessions, uh, which actually uh, guided us to come up with the listing I was just reading out. Uh, what we haven't done at this point in time is uh, to reconvene because we got those ideas, we went and posted them just to make sure that we have the capability to be able to initiate them. Uh, and then from that standpoint, we are taking the ideas back to, to that group uh, so that we can uh, figure out what we need to prioritize, what is sustainable and uh, how we move forward in the future as, as a group. So, so we are still kind of in the same, uh, we are still kind of in the process of identifying uh, what it is that everybody feels like we need to uh, 
uh, in, uh, prioritized for now, and then how much that costs and what do we need to uh, move forward to to the following year. All right. I don't want to repeat anything else yet. Thank you, Teriro. Can you just go back to the criteria slide, please? Here we go. Oops. Back to. Okay. So we're going to continue using these as criteria. They are a combination of Vision 2031 aligned criteria. We also read, um, for example, the link at the bottom bullet yeah. was a link to some um, research to support forward thinking districts and how to use. Um, federal COVID relief funds. And so we found the guiding principles that that article offered to be very helpful and in line with our vision, in line with the future of um, learning, but also, you know, um, our core values, who we are and how we operate in Hopkins and how we want to support our students. Um, so we'll continue to use these. And then I just wanted to speak candidly to attention that we're feeling around. Um, Maybe just being in this space where are we, are, do people have survey fatigue, right? Are we over <laughs> surveying our families, our staff, our scholars, our, you know, we, we're continuing to have community engagement sessions, which of course is the right thing to do. However, to what point do people say, look, you've asked us a thousand times in a thousand different ways what we value, what's important to us, and we really are relying on you to look at this, the feedback that you've received from us and also to use your expertise to start making some smart decisions about how to serve our scholars well. So I just wanted to speak honestly to that tension that we feel. Should we, should we offer a couple of community engagement sessions and ask our students and our families specifically, we have these dollars, how do you think you know, um, we should spend them, and will we get responses that are very similar to what we've already received when we've asked that that question in similar ways, or will we get some new information? Are there are are there some new learning or support needs that you know that we haven't identified yet? So, that's sort of the space that we're in. You know, we we love um, interacting with, engaging with our scholars and with our families and staff, and you know, we don't want to act like we haven't carefully scrutinized all of the information that we've received to date because we really have. Um, so, but these these um, criteria here will continue to be very useful for us and hopefully you, you know, can see the value in them, but we're open to feedback from our school board members as well as you are, you know, representing our, our um, community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions and comments for Director Chapanduka? Chair Bouchard. Yes, Vice Chair Andreessen. Thank you. Um, and thanks for the, the detail involved in this report. I think it was really informative. Um, I had a couple of questions. One is just clarification when um, you went through some of the the funding slides, it talked about um, building allocations that um, where some of the funds were going. And that um, gave me some questions around um, when funds are allocated to a building, does that include the special services that happen in that building? Or um, it is the dollar amount that we saw in the one slide allocated to special services the only funds that are allocated to um, to those students and families and staff. And then along with that, I'm wondering um, what happens with um, these programs that like the distance learning, is that part of our building allocations and what kind of longevity 
do we have to these programs if they're mostly funded by ESSER funds? Uh, thank you, uh, Director Anderson. Uh, I'll start by answering your first question about uh, special services. And uh, if those funds uh, which are going into buildings, uh, including uh, the programs which are related to special services, uh, the answer is correct. So when we uh, when we calculate the basic per students, it's calculating the basic per students for all the students in a building, including the special uh, special services students. Uh, the other piece which uh, we allocated to the special services department. Uh, again, some of those dollars are going into the building, uh, but uh, it was to address some of the needs uh, which were really uh, uh, pressing uh, for special services to support our our buildings. But the allocations are definitely including our special uh, services students. Great, thank you. And I think we did hear at our last meeting about where some of our special service funding goes outside of um, school buildings in our district. So thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. And then on the uh, online school, so what we've done, uh, one, just considering where we were when the pandemic hit and how we had to pivot from uh, our traditional way of education to, uh, uh, to online learning. Uh, what we found out is at the beginning of the uh, school year, uh, after doing some uh, surveys uh, to our families, we had a portion of our students who were not comfortable for one reason or another to get back into our buildings. So what we had to do is we had to quickly shift and uh, uh, thankful for the availability of these extra dollars. We were actually able to uh, uh, start the online school and I'm sure uh, I think you, you have had some presentation from the IDL department on uh, the online Royal Academy uh, uh, school we started. So as a starting point, we are using ESA funds, uh, but going into the future, uh, we will have to actually leverage our general funds uh, to sustain the, uh, the online school. Uh, so what this will uh, mean is we'll use the predictable staffing model uh, to allocate resources based on those students who are preferring to uh, to be on the online school instead of our traditional classrooms. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, no and my last question is around, um, there were was a couple mentions of this phrase that I think we've all heard a lot, which is learning loss. Um, and I'm wondering, one of uh, some conversations that I've been having in the community is specifically, do we know what the impact of that has been on, on Hopkins? And then I, as um, a parent, am wondering, do we have any sense of how that phrase has been measured? What criteria are we using to talk about learning loss? That might be a better question for. Yeah, I can try to tackle a response and then, or provide a response. <laughs> <laughs> tackle the question, provide a response. Um, and then maybe we should have an agenda item at an upcoming workshop to dive more deeply into this. So um, I was in a classroom, a, I think it was a second grade classroom today at Tanglin, Miss O'Neill. Is that second grade? Dr. Lightfoot, is Ms. O'Neill teaching second grade at Tanglin? Yes, she is. Okay. So, and students were in small groups, and there were um, there was an MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support provider, working one, one with one small group of students, and then um, there was an EL, English language learner, learning teacher working with another small group, and I just asked questions about how the students were grouped and why they were in those groups. So students had taken a fast bridge assessment this morning and there was um, another assessment, I think she called it a CBA, a CBA assessment. And uh, Director Ertl, if you're on the call, you can help me with this as well. Um, 
And she was explaining that they are using diagnostics right now to assess both where students sh maybe should have been, right, had we not gone through a pandemic year, but also what students will need moving forward. And so these assessments are happening right now across all of our classroom spaces in literacy and in math. And then we can start to triangulate, triangulate the data. We can look at MCA scores from last spring because we just got those results within the last couple of weeks. We can also overlap that achievement data with some of our panorama data that students, um, when students took self-assessments, talking about their satisfaction levels with schools, how they felt supported, what they were struggling with. So we want to use some of the student self-assessment data around engagement and just you know um, perception of schooling and their learning and overlap it with achievement data to start to discern are there gaps and you know are the gaps based on you know maybe a traditional um, a traditional framework are at this grade level students have to be here at this grade level students have to be you know at, at this other place or are are we feeling confident that students are learning and are being supported at a pace that is right for each of them as, as unique and individual learners. So that's a lot of data to look at. And thank goodness we hired our instructional data scientist and our, um, our data specialists at all of our schools to really start to build for us a, a smart way of using data in Hopkins. You know, we've, we have so much um, data power right now, and I'm really excited about it. And I do see um, Director Ertl. Is there any, did I explain that? Um, well, don't tell me if I explained that well. Could you, <laughs> is there anything that you would like to add to the question? Did you, were you able to hear Vice Chair Andreessen's question, Anne? I did, yeah. And I think it would be a neat thing to share out on more once we um, have kind of the results, as Dr. Mary Perry Reed mentioned, of all of the diagnostics that are really literally occurring right now in, in many of our elementary classrooms. Um, the only thing I think I would add is, you know, we have been really intentional around not using language like learning loss um, because we believe in, in personalized learning experiences that uh, grow students from wherever they're at. And so, um, and, and some, of the, some of the specific examples of that include some of our multi-age classrooms right now um, it, well, it, it really wouldn't make sense to look at a first grader by age in comparison with a second grader. What the teachers are, are doing and practicing and working with every day is where is this child at? And then what is the trajectory of learning um, to grow the child from, from wherever they're at? So that whole, um, I know the, the, the language of learning loss is everywhere and it's, you know, it's federal language, but People sort of adopt it too, uh, but we've been really intentional not to not to use that language. Great, thank you. I did have just one more kind of quick follow-up <laughs> question. I saw a headline um, as I was um, getting ready to come to the to the meeting about um, the stress that educators are under right now, and in particular because we are experiencing across the state a, a staffing shortage. And just wondering, um, I, I think I saw a couple of line items that were specifically dedicated to um, developing ways that are really innovative around supporting our staff, but wondering if there's any more ideation around ways that we can help support our staff that are under a lot of pressure right now, even if they aren't short staffed, which I think um, we are experiencing that in Hopkins as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Vice Chair Andreessen. Um, and you're right, this is a unique um, period in time where there are a lot of factors contributing to higher than normal stress levels for our educators, for our leaders, and I was talking with an HEF board member who's in the medical industry. He's, um, I think he's a physical therapist, but he also manages a clinic. And he was talking about the very high stress levels 
in that field. So I do think it's cross industry. Um, however, with teaching and learning being such a, you know, human centered job, there, you know, there's thousands of personal interactions each and every day. Um, we do know that our educators, because they are so committed to providing quality service, you know, there's there's a lot I think to be um, worried about if you sort of let yourself get there. So um, we do have, and there is um, on the um, the next agenda item for a workshop, we are going to focus on wellness, and there will be a team to help board members and community members understand what specific. Um, scholar and staff wellness. Um, we have a number of restorative culture specialists at our schools, and their job is to work with leaders and staff in, in building restorative culture and helping staff and scholars um, acquire restorative practices that contribute to cultures of wellness, of people feeling valued and seen and heard, equal voices, um, so I think that restorative specialists will do a, a really great job building a foundation of wellness um, within and across Hopkins. And so ESSER funding is, is definitely supporting that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, th I think we'll hear more with the next agenda item and then maybe we can see if board members have questions about um, what we're doing or how we might do things differently or um, or add to what we're doing. Great, thank mm -hmm. you. So I have a related question around um, staffing and I was wondering if you were gonna get to it because you were, you were like almost there. <laughs> so, so at this um, board table we've talked a lot about how we need to be strategic with our ESSER dollars in terms of um, creating staff positions and funding staff positions with this, with these monies because they're one-time funds. And so throughout the presentation, um, you know, we heard about additional para positions, restorative specialists, counselors, um, credit recovery teachers who have been funded through the ESSER funds. And I'm wondering if you could give us an idea of how many, st approximately, how many staff positions were created using the ESSER funds? And then, um, you know, plans for sustainability or like what, what does it look like once this money runs out? Tariro, I know that we're working with Dr. Lightfoot on compiling that data. Do we know if it's ready? Uh, so, so, so what we do at this point in time, uh, with the uh, counselors who have been actually funded out of uh, ESA in all our buildings, uh, the piece we are actually working on is the the plan which we are just getting from uh, from buildings. So we don't have all the details at this point in time. Uh, the principals have been actually sending us uh, uh, the plans on uh, what they are actually doing with those dollars and uh, some of those plans do have uh, additional FTEs for uh, for the parents or uh, support staff or uh, additional teachers for specific areas uh, but we don't have it handy uh, at this point in time Chair Bouchard to kind of give you the actual uh, details on how many people or how many FTEs have been have been hired comprehensively through the ESSA dollars. But we can we can get that information to you as soon as we uh, hear back from the remaining uh, buildings. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. I think it's gonna be useful information for the board to have as we enter into our budgeting conversations, um, just so that we understand, you know, which of those positions are funded by ESSA dollars currently, and then how we need to be thinking about um, budget allocations to, to sustain some of those positions, if we need to be seeking funding elsewhere, um, you know, just so that we have that, that baseline, I think it'll be really helpful. So I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to add to what you said, uh, 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 Chair Bouchard, uh, what we've done with some of the ESSA dollars, we've been very explicit with our buildings, uh, that these are one-time funds. So however they are going to use them, uh, it has to be temporary. 
unless if we get additional funding from the state or they want to keep a position, then they will have to use their uh, discretionary dollars, uh, but they have to take something off the table to be able to afford to do that. Uh, but that information has been shared with our, our leaders on how uh, fragile these dollars are and how we can only be able to use them this time. So if they have to add, add an FTE, they just have to know that that FTE may go away once the dollars are gone. And that would be related to the predictable staffing model work that the building leaders are doing as they're anticipating needs for next year as well. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That, that is correct. So for example, if they hire a position using the ESA dollars right now, and uh, knowing that uh, that position may not be sustainable into the future, so there will be some need to tweak things uh, within the predictable staffing model if that position they are hiring is uh, a position which is bringing value, of which I'm sure all the positions are bringing value, but if they want to keep that position, then we'll have to make some tweaks and changes to the predictable staffing model to accommodate for that. That makes sense, thank you. Any additional comments or questions before we move to our next agenda item? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Director Chapanduka, and I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Mary Piri reed Thank you very much, Chair Bouchard. I'm gonna okay, so the next agenda item is the district wellness update, and we do have a team of individuals of leaders who will provide a comprehensive support. And we do look forward to your questions because right now we, what our aspiration is, is to ensure that we have a, a very um, detailed and responsive plan for how we're going to address and support student and staff wellness throughout Hopkins and we want this plan and the execution of it to be as tight as possible. So we definitely welcome your questions. Um, as you know, we have six system goals that we've articulated in Hopkins Public Schools and one is a culture goal. So our culture system goal is that as a district, we will increase wellness by building a workplace culture that is safe and caring. We will experience wholeness by increasing trust, sharing power, in ensuring people are of equal worth. And while we don't explicitly mention mental health or mental wellness, we can't achieve any of these um, indicators in this goal statement without focusing on mental wellness. And so this is um, absolutely inclusive of focusing on psychological safety, on mental wellness, on people feeling um, that they are able to manage anxiety, to manage um, challenging situations, to belong to a team that feels supportive and, and they have places or people or resources to tap into when things feel um, less manageable. So with that framing, I would love for our Director of um, Community Education, Alex Fisher, to pop on and introduce the team. I think we have, I don't know, Alex, five or six people with you this evening? Yeah, I think that's all right, people. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Mary Perry Reed, good evening. Hi, Chair Bouchard and respected members, directors of the board. Um, we do have a slideshow, so I wanted to ask if it made sense for me to project the slideshow, the, the Google Slides, or will someone else be doing that? <laughs> Elise said she'll do it. Okay, okay, great. Thanks, Elise. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, Elise. So I want to make sure I remember um, everyone here tonight. So why don't I start off um, as per Dr. Mary Peary Reed's suggestion and just introduce the team here in front of you tonight. Um, we have Director Fonda Contreras uh, joining us. We have, um, I'm just right now going down my screen, so this is in no particular order, but <laughs> Rushi Song is here from IDL. 
Erica Olson is here representing student nutrition. Uh, Brian Stanley is here from uh, student services. And um, Julie is here as well. Julie, I don't see you, but I think you're here. Julie Kazmarek, there you are. Julie Kazmarek is here as well. Um, have I forgotten? Holly, did I mention Holly Magdans from Community Ed? Holly is here as well. So um, I wanted to just kind of give a brief overview before I hand it over to the team um, to explain a little bit about why we are a team and so you can kind of experience the collaborative nature of how we're handling wellness this year. Um, you know, as Dr. Mary Peary Reed said, it is a major priority for our district this year to um, cover wellness and handle wellness in um, the most prioritized way possible. And in doing that, um, we have created kind of a collaborative uh, team of oversight that um, I think handles um, wellness quite well. So <clears throat> we put together this team after a number of conversations, um, realizing that you know wellness encompasses so many areas across our district, across our system, that it's really not just owned by one individual or one person. It's really a collaborative effort and to get the most out of our um, wellness, you know, it really needs to span across the district. So we started meeting this summer to kind of put together the, the collaborative wellness model. Um, and we have decided to follow the CDC model of whole school, whole community, whole child framework. Um, Elise, I'm wondering if you might be able to just click on the link there. So just to briefly show it to the to the board and the community here. So this is from the, the CDC. It is a, a school model of wellness and it has different um, components to it, kind of different sub areas. And um, I'll go over that briefly now just to give you a high level overview of these sub areas and who is responsible for them. And then you'll hear from members of the team so Elise, thank you so much. If you don't mind going back to the, the slide presentation now. So our, oh, I'm sorry, could you go back one quick sec? Thank you. So our Vision 2031 success indicator for wellness is we want to become a destination district for wellness for staff and students. And that's really our goal. Thank you, Elise. Um, so here are the components that I mentioned that come from the CDC framework. There's uh, on the left hand side, you'll see the wellness component. And then on the right hand side, you see the staff person responsible for that component. Um, for nutrition and environment, it's a little blurry, so I apologize for kind of stumbling here, but nutrition, does this say in nutrition, environment and services? Yes. I believe it. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's Barb McCurra and Erica, Erica Olson oversee that. Um, the next component is social and emotional climate counseling, psychological and social services. And that's Fonda Contreras and Brian Stanley. And then physical environment, and that's Kevin Newman. Health services, that's Mary Jo Martin. Employee wellness, that's Julie Kazmarek and Erica Olson. And community involvement and family engagement. That's myself and Holly Magdans. And physical education, health education, and physical activity. And that is overseen by Ann Ertl and Allegra uh, Smishik. Um, so at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Holly Magdans, who was the chair for our um, wellness task force two summers ago. Holly? Yes, hi. Hi, thank you, everyone. I, my part will be fairly brief because you have heard much of this information before, but it's been over a year. Um, if we could advance to the next slide, that would be great. Perfect, thank you. So in the summer of 2020, um, I co-led the Staff and Student Wellness Task Force with Brooke Davis and Leslie Rounds. And in phase one, uh, what we really focused on was building this model that you see here. I know it's hard to read on the screen, um, but what it, it what it encompasses is our proposed model for supporting staff and student wellness. And we felt um, very strongly coming out of that phase one task force that we have to treat 
staff and student wellness as um, a shared entities that we can't have one without the other. And I think um, sometimes the staff wellness part um, is a little harder for us to, to grasp. So uh, that was our model um, from phase one. Our four priorities, which were based on trauma-informed practices around distance learning, were empowerment, flexibility, predictability, and connection. And then in phase two, and you can keep the slide, that's fine. Phase two, um, we dug deeper and really looked at what, what the plans would be for, for supporting staff and student wellness going into um, the 2020-2021 school year. And we really came out with three priorities. One was creating a self-care culture for staff and students on the building and district level. The second priority was relationship building between and among staff and students. And the third priority was that social emotional learning would be provided to all students that is developed and executed with an equity and anti-racist lens and involves data-based decision making along with tiered interventions based on individual student needs. And again, that task force um, works the, the summer of 2020. Um, and I'm gonna actually turn it over to Brian now for updates on the social emotional learning and Fonda as well. And they can give you more of an update on that part and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. All right. Good evening, Chair Bruce Prather and all respected members. Um, Brian and I are going to present a little bit about our current services that we have for um, social emotional learning. Um, and I just really think uh, where we want to go in Hopkins is to, like Holly mentioned, is create a holistic model that we're um, working to support students um, in all areas of wellness and academics. I think traditionally we all have went through school models that focused on the academics and not so much SEL, but we're to a different point in life and we know that our students need these things. And then it supports social emotional intelligences. So I put something at the bottom, just a little quote, intertwining social emotional learning and academics advances the ability of our students to adapt, to change with essential skills, to effectively manage new challenges. And this includes, um, you know, building that empath empathetic student that we want to have. Next slide. So currently for social emotional curriculum, we use Panorama. We have used it across grades to kind of identify um, what are the needs. So in earlier grades, the teachers and students have input. And then um, in the intermediate grades, the students can fill out surveys and teachers can use that to drill down on what they need to help support a student individually or by classroom. And so paired with that is second step curriculum, which supports the areas of learning and panorama around social emotional skills. So it can drill down to very specific areas that the teacher and or um, SEL staff can support. Also at the elementary, there are things happening like Superflex, Mind Up, Yoga Calm, um, Social Detective, and um, the Zones of Regulation, just to name some things that are being used. Next slide. So the social worker at Gatewood wrote a grant um, to get a very unique um, type of activity going to support learners around social emotional learning and it's nature based in neurobiology so students get to plant things and learn express their feelings while they're gardening i'm not a gardener but this is proven to kind of help um just support that neural um neural mind growth and so we've had an existing partnership with part nicolette's growing through grief um, and that service is for um, counseling for students that have experienced various types of grief. We also did some writing, I believe, two to three years ago 
um, to put things in place um, before it happens and to support staff that also experience grief of working with students in different areas. And ironically, this was put together prior to the pandemic, so definitely an important resource. St. David's is now this year at all four elementary. In the past, um, we were waiting to add to Gatewood and to Meadowbrook. So currently we have four full-time therapists at the other four elementaries and the Gatewood and Meadowbrook um, are, no, that's not right, I'm sorry. Alice Smith and Ike have our full-time therapists. And then there are four other therapists that share the other sites. So they're kind of part-time and doing split assignments. So we currently have the St. David's co-located services coming on board to support students. Next slide. We wrote a grant two years ago to have Relate Counseling um, help support our early, early scholars in ECSE. And we are working to um, still kind of build that program model of what that looks like. In the secondary, we have moved forward. Um, this service is at all of our secondary sites. It's free to students and it helps to organize and support students' basic needs and to ensure that they are feeling safe with themselves. We also have BAR, the BAR program. Um, and this is a strength-based program that really does a good job of um, doing a kind of a cross model of supporting academics at high levels with social emotional learning um, through this, the use of data and positive relationships. So there's models, I think there's some assessments that students take surveys to help support that model. And then change to chill, um, has been supported in our district to support our high school students. Um, and it's a free program sponsored by Alina that helps our teens better manage stress and build resiliency. Next slide. Many of our schools are adapting restorative spaces. So within the school, designating spaces to do that restorative work. It's always invited into every classroom, but having those spaces to kind of provides a neutral ground for staff and students to engage in. There are calming rooms at Carly and most of our K-6 sites. Each elementary teacher was presented the opportunity to um, build something in their classroom for calming. And, it's a calming corner sponsored through a HEP grant written in uh, 2020. So those funds are still out there for staff <laughs> at the elementary level to create calming corners within their own individual classrooms. Alice Smith is now implementing the Royals Tales, which is an animal therapy program where students read to animals. And then finally, our partners in HEP have helped to fund the wellness center. Um, I think several years ago, many of the adults had ideas of what we wanted to do and provide to students. But when we went back and really included students' voice, the wellness centers came about. And so it's a place where students can go before, during, and after school to kind of check in and their staff there to kind of help them with whatever it is they're going through. And then finally, we have some other scholars in our district. Um, so Buddha <laughs> attends Gatewood Elementary. Buddha has been there for quite some time. Bo is at West Junior High, and so is Danny. So we're hoping to expand these cute little scholars because um, they bring a lot of joy to students and staff alike. Thank you. And I turn it over if there's any questions about any of the SEL that's happening at, at school. 
Chair Bouchard. Yes, Director I, Adams. I have a question. Sure. Uh, and uh, well, thank you, uh, Fonda. I, I don't know if you can answer this question or somebody else could, but how many students have we served thus far with, uh, with all these different programs that we've got? Um, we could gather that data. I don't know offhand. Hmm. I know the initial rollout of um, kind of services in secondary was kind of slow to start. And then prior to COVID, we really saw things pick up with the reinvented wellness centers, like it was constant. Um, and so, and that was prior to COVID. I'm not sure what it looks like now. And I know with our St. David's therapist, we, um, except for our new locations this year, it's pretty steady and constant that they keep students. Some sites have waiting lists. Hmm. So, right. and, and this is just what we have now. We definitely have conversations um, in the making to continue to expand and because there are definitely more needs that we see and we want to make sure we have kind of a variety of offerings. All right. Yeah, if you could get those numbers at some point, I, I'm, I'm curious what percent of our student population takes advantage of these, uh, these resources. I just had a quick follow-up question on the St. David's co-location services. Are those um, the therapists that are funded through grants through the state legislature? Yes, and um, well, two of them, it's a combination. So some of it is state funded and then they also build, build, um, they build insurances. So we did for um, adding the two sites this year, Gatewood and Meadowbrook, they just asked for an amount, I think it was 35,000, and that's to help offset some cost um, for therapists, but to be at two sites, that's very cheap, but they do bill insurances as well. Okay, so continuing to advocate for expansion of that program and stabilization of the funding would be good. Correct. And Fonda, the two that were added are funded through ESSER, correct? <laughs> Correct, those are ESSER dollars that are funding the hmm. on start of them this year, and it was for overhead cost that they have. Thank you. Chair Bouchard. Yeah, Director Cole. Um, great presentation, Fonda. One question, when a student um, gets put into one of these programs, is it normally based on a recommendation from a teacher, a parent, or both? It can be both. And we really want to make sure like um, that it's a tiered approach so that um, students that have outside services, but there's kind of like a priority and that students that have outside services may not be considered first, that we consider students that don't have access to services and it's prioritized at sites. So, yeah. So it could be a referral from a combination, but working parents working in conjunction with the staff. And if I can add to that, Fonda, real quickly at the secondary level, if I think about uh, move forward in particular, that's a lot of time uh, a student driven process that they explore maybe with a school counselor or school social worker. And through that process, the student identifies and. and kind of reaches out to say, I would like to, to access those therapeutic services. And then what we do is just kind of facilitate that connection if they're under the age of 18 uh, with the family. And then from that point, move forward, takes that process on. Um, and then we set up opportunities for that therapy to happen, you know, on site during different times of the school day as well. One quick follow up then. I, I know Fonda, you had mentioned that in some cases there's a waiting list for some of these programs. And so, knowing that a lot of the um, mental health can be so um, needed quickly in some cases, what are the alternatives um, and, and how do you all at the student, uh, at the school level work through those type of issues? That's a good question. So there has been times when other schools, so in particular, there's two schools that share a therapist. 
when there was a waiting list at one and the other one had some high needs and they, they didn't have slots. So they were able to kind of share a, a slot per se so that um, student, a student that was really in need could get supported. But I actually had a couple meetings with um, two different providers today. One was Frazier and one was St. David's about expanding. Um, and they are experiencing a shortage of staff as well. Hmm. And so it's really like, I mean, I think our counselors and social workers are experiencing this as well of trying to meet the needs of students, but mental health services are there. I think each sector is experiencing just a staff of a staff shortage. And so, and we are able to cross share at times. Um, but then there's waiting lists, and some of it is due, like I said, with the providers um, that I met with this morning. They just, they're looking for staff themselves. Uh, and if I may add to that, I mean, I think it's not just our own wait list internally for our co-located services um, or for move forward, but we're hearing already the um, both due to staff shortages, but increase in mental health needs that we're seeing substantial wait lists for day treatments, for inpatient, um, for thera therapeutic day treatments that don't go in weeks, they go in by months now is what I'm hearing from families that they're discussing. So I think our role and responsibility is to continue to think about how do we expand wellness and mental health beyond just what we traditionally see as um, intervention, which is you know the therapeutic services. It needs to speak to the therapy dog, the uh, culture of uh, wellness climate and what we can do as far as adults in taking care of ourselves, but taking care of our students and providing environments because our schools do have a lot of environmental and social stressors and academic stressors. And throughout the course of the day, there's gonna be those needs that we take that approach of wellness that is non-traditional, at least on how we've always viewed like social workers and counselors as students who's experiencing some level of emotional difficulty that we need to be proactive and create systems and opportunities, learning opportunities throughout the day that address wellness, just like we always speak about reading math and writing needs too. Great answer, thank you. Great. Yeah, I think we can continue to, to move through the presentation in the interest of time. Thank you so much, Director Contreras. Okay, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me, Katie? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, good evening. My name is Roshi Sung. It's my honor to talk a little bit about the restorative culture in our schools. So in my presentation, basically, it's empowered by two questions. First, I would like to talk a little bit about restorative practitioners in our school buildings. As you can see in the bar graph, so we have 17 restorative practitioners in the school buildings. And uh, as you can see in the word cloud, that is generated based on a recent survey sent out to them. And uh, here are some keywords. They describe their daily job around with uh, our restorative culture. Basically, all this can be summed up into three perspectives. That is uh, to develop a restorative Insight to build up community and to repair harm, and by developing, uh, and by building up a relational learning climate with authentic and nurturing relationships among students, staff, and community. This is a way for them to support wellness within our schools. So the second question in my presentation is about our circles now being used in our schools as we expected them to be? The answer is yes and. So I would like to give a little bit of detail about that. We say yes to that question is because we can say that multiple times a week, there are restorative culture circles happen in the classroom. Some there are during the morning meeting time at the nursery or during the classroom instructional times. For some school buildings, it will be a very special time, for example, Friday in the morning for 30 minutes. The part end is about like, it hasn't been being used regularly throughout the buildings and there's positive from regular use as well as 
um, procedural pieces as needed. So that is our next step to continue work on developing restorative uh, men's light. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie and I am the district benefit coordinator. I'm not sure if Erica is on. I am, sorry you guys, I've got screaming children outside my door, <laughs> so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> yeah, they just came home from daycare, so. Um, I can start, Julie, if you want a little, I can talk a little bit about start virtual and I'll do, okay. Yeah. All right, perfect. So, um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, we are kind of pleased to announce that we're off to a good start with the staff wellness this year. Um, we do have um, Virgin Pulse up and running. Um, maybe some of you are aware of, like, we've got our walking challenge going on right now. Um, a couple of years ago, we made the choice and the change to have the Virgin Pulse, the online platform, available to all staff. And so... Uh, we're really hoping to continue to get more people enrolled in that program. It, um, uh, you know, from statistics that we've looked at, we do know that um, it's really good for, for promoting behavior change. So um, as just sort of a general goal for this year, we're hoping to get at least 75% or so of our staff um, and spouses of staff to enroll in the program. So, um, and with that, there's also um, what's called FinFit. So it offers financial support to staff, um, well-being, mindfulness. So staff have, it's not just um, like nutrition or physical activity. It does offer programs for um, mental well-being as well. Yeah, that's a great point, Julie. We do, there's a connection to the WILL program on there. Um, so we've actually kind of expanded our offerings for the um, connection through Will on there. So there's lots of different meditation courses, different um, mindfulness courses and things like that that people can participate in that were not available previously. So to Julie's point, a lot of times people think that it is mainly for activity or nutrition or those types of things, but there is a, a very big financial and mental health component to the program. Yeah, and then um, we do offer an employee assistance program, and this is for all employees and their family. Um, we do know it's underutilized. Um, we did switch to a new vendor as of July 1st, so we are hoping to get um, participation numbers quarterly to see how many staff are participating, um, reaching out, and what this offers, I mean, it offers a lot of different programs. Um, what I put on the site was it offers five counseling sessions per person, per issue, per year. And this is for not just our employee, but for their family members as well. And this is mainly for short-term um, issues that come up for a staff member or family member. It's just to get them, you know, initial help and then if they have recommendations of where to where they could be seen if it has to go beyond those five sessions it also also offers in-person consultations with attorneys um, you get a discount for that it also offers elder care child care because we know that is um, that can cause a lot of stressors in our staff's lives um, it's their family matters um, you know estate planning it offers consumer and civil law guidance financial guidance how to budget um, there's many articles and tutorials that staff can download from the website it also goes into nutrition um, family emotional relationship issues that may come up so hopefully this will be an option for our staff to you know seek out initial help if needed Um, Julie, do you want to talk about the biometrics and I can talk about wellness champs? Sure. Um, okay. Coming up in November, we are offering biometric screenings, and this is for 
basically anyone um, in the district because we know um, numbers matter. So we wanna make sure that staff have resources. So that is coming up in November. Our goal is to get 50% participation this, she, this year. Um, and staff members do not have to do it here. We, are, we will be offering it at four different locations, but, um, and it's through Quest, and they can actually go physically to the Quest location by Southdale, and they can also um, have their numbers updated by their physicians. And we're hopeful to do this. Last year, we couldn't do it just because of the pandemic, but we're hopeful to get a, you know staff participating in this just so they get a baseline and then we can continue to do this from um, year after year. So that way staff know where they're at from one year to the next. All right, and then for wellness champs, um, we do still have wellness champs in all of our sites. So we have them everywhere, including um, the district office, uh, Transition Plus and Harley. Hopkins. Um, we have one to two champs in all of those sites, except for we're looking for a couple new ones for Glen Lake this year. Um, we had our first meeting last week. Everybody was really excited to get going with some various programming. Um, so, you know, they do help support Virgin Pulse. They help, um, you know, support and get the word out about the biometric screenings and those types of things. But um, they all also do some on-site programming. So really depending on what the school is most interested in or you know, kind of responds to whether it's like heart healthy bingo or um, lunch and learns, those types of things. I know some of them are gonna be setting up some um, like fitness trainers to come and do some after school programming. So really kind of it, it depends on the site as to what the wellness champs are offering. And um, yeah, this year, though, the big talk, and I, I know I've shared with some of you guys, is that they're very excited about this wellness collaborative. We talked about it in our meeting last week and got some additional feedback. And so, you know, they're really looking for, um, I think Fonda mentioned that, you know, this is a destination for wellness, um, but for that cultural wellness change. So, you know, our, our kind of tagline lately from some of our champs has been that they don't, they don't want another a smoothie event or um, you know baked potato bar they really want to start to see some <laughs> cultural change around putting health and wellness to the forefront here at Hopkins and so they're pretty excited that we're we're having these conversations although they said they'd still take the smoothies <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it for ours right Julie I think we have one more okay. slide. And I just wanted to go over what's involved with our medical plan. And this is for staff and dependents enrolled in medical. So once the pandemic started, so I believe in March 2020, we worked with Preferred One and they have a virtual clinic essentially called MD Live that also offers 24 seven um, counselors. Um, so obviously we know that it's um, difficult to get appointments. But we do offer this. Um, it's a $25 copay for counseling sessions, and it will help with anything from addictions, um, depression, grief and loss, life changes, panic disorders, stress, trauma, and PTSD. So this is um, an avenue our staff who are independents that are enrolled in the medical plan have access to. Um, also, these are some services provided by Preferred One. WellBeats is a new program um, that offers fitness, nutrition, and mindfulness. And I did see that in July, when that program just started, we had 27 um, staff members participate in classes. Um, so that was off to a good start. And then we also offer, um, through Preferred One, a fitness advantage plan. Um, so for those that belong to a gym and they're a per preferred, preferred um, fitness facility, um, our staff members can get $20 off if they visit 12 times per month. Um, and, you know, for some staff, that is just a great stress reliever is just to, you know, step into a different world and just go to the gym and um, get active. So those are what um, we have available through preferred one or medical plan as well. That's it for me. If anybody has questions. Oh, 
Great, thank you so much. Um, any questions or comments from my board colleagues? Well, it was really wonderful to hear about the holistic approach, approach we're taking to wellness here um, in terms of both serving our scholars and our staff and family members. Um, because it has such an impact on our entire community. One of the earlier slides said, you know, that um, we are taking this holistic approach, but there's so much else that we know that we want to do. Um, and so I would be curious just briefly, um, what are some of those other components that we're not doing now that, um, that we're thinking about moving toward in the future, just so the board can, can be aware of that and so we can be supportive of that work? Trevor Richard, do you recall the slide that that was on? Um, yes, it was slide five. So there was kind of a paragraph. And then at the bottom, we have various supports in place in Hopkins, but we also have a ways to go to build what our scholars deserve. While you're thinking, um, Alex, I just have um, one thing to share, and then we'll see what ideas are coming from the group. So um, one specific thing that we've been um, thinking about and organizing ourselves around is revitalizing and retraining crisis response teams in each of our schools. So we had them super intact about two years ago before the pandemic hit. And since then, we've been focused so much on responding to the pandemic. Also, we've had a little bit of turnover in our you know, leaders and teachers. So we want to revitalize and retrain those teams. We have some resources that will allow us to do that. And we also want to be um, to put together a district level crisis response team that um, is, you know, that works together to support the site teams and can be immediately contacted if there is, you know, some kind of whether it's small scale or, you know, more significant crisis in each of our schools. Now, this is obviously um, the purpose of these crisis response teams is not just responding to a crisis, but also, um, you know, looking at things like ensuring that staff in a school, especially our um, junior high and senior high staff, have suicide prevention training, right? So identifying the different kinds of training that our staff need to provide um, proactive wellness supports to students, but also um, training that the crisis response team would need to provide support to staff. So that's one specific um, thing that we'll be um, really focused on in the next um, two to three weeks. And then, um, Alex, did you, did you or your team members have any other responses for the question from Chair Bouchard? I have okay. it. Um, the okay. respondents. Yes. So, and basically it's just to meet the needs of all of our scholars with the growing, like I feel like uh, with the growing needs of mental health supports and SEL, we trying to match so that we can meet that demand. And I feel like we're not there yet. There's still way more. And one example that I can give you. So um, we've met early childhood staff and myself have met with um, two providers just today because we know that we're missing a great deal of early ECSE families that start with Hopkins and then they leave. They leave Hopkins and go to um, treatment for a or for asd because we don't have it and we've had at least i want to say 18 families over the last three years to leave start with us leave go get that um therapy intense asd therapy and then they come back some of them come back to hopkins and so if we could keep him, them here by not having them leave I mean, that would be ideal. And so, like I said, we had meetings with Frazier today and with St. David's to talk about it. And just to give you a little more reference, St. David's said they have a waiting list 
um, because they can't meet the needs of students all day. So it would be a perfect, like it would be a perfect couple. But again, it's a staffing thing. They would have to get staff, right? Staff. And so we're hopeful we can start early to work on that. But that's just one example. So all needs aren't met because we still need to be adding to our platform of what we have. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Can I give one more example, Chair Bouchard? Please. Um, I think one, one more example would be, you know how we have the six system goals that we're all working towards. And one of the goals, the empathy goal, um, has to do with acknowledging imbalances of power. So I think as a staff, when we think about really creating a wellness environment where people feel valued and seen and heard and empowered, um, you know, that it's, we have some work to go there as far as, um, you know, acknowledging imbalances of power and we can, what we can do as leaders is start meetings with circles. So we're starting to do that, hopefully pretty much across the board where, where most of our departments and our leaders are starting meetings with restorative circles. We know we have a ways to go there, but we're making progress. Um, and then just modeling what it means, you know, to have equal worth and to show what that means to our staff and to the people that we, that we work with. So that's, you know, a, a goal area for us, something we're working towards and we hope to accomplish. Thank you very much. All three of those specific examples um, were really helpful for me um, as, as we continue as a board to support this work of holistic wellness. And also as we think about opportunities to collaborate um, throughout different layers of government too, and resources that, that are available. So as we're talking with our partners, for example, in county government and state government, um, thinking about our, our specific needs here and how we might partner to fill those. So um, thank you very much. In the interest of time, uh, we are going to move our last agenda item to the next workshop, we'll still have time to cover it. Um, but I wanted to, to thank the team for, for this wonderful holistic wellness presentation. Um, thank you to my board colleagues and our student board reps for um, a, a jam packed workshop. We covered a lot of ground. And um, so we'll end the workshop now. We'll take about a 10 minute break and I'll see you back at the table at seven for our meeting.
open agenda, and this is when we welcome public comment from our community members. There are two options for giving public comment um, via voicemail. We did not receive any voicemails in advance of tonight's meeting and in person. The board will host two public comment periods per meeting. The first period will be during open agenda at the beginning of the meeting, during which the board will only hear public comments related to items on the agenda for this particular meeting. The period will be a maximum of 30 minutes long and speakers will be heard on a first come first serve basis. The second period will be at the end of the board meeting prior to adjournment. During this period, the board will hear public comments on items not on the agenda. That period will also be a maximum of 30 minutes long. Speakers will be heard on a first come first serve basis. So we have one uh, member of our community with us for public comment this evening commenting on an item that is on the agenda, which is our board resolution regarding school nutrition and the meals program. And so I'd like to welcome Jen Cameron to the table. And Jen, you'll have three minutes to share your thoughts with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I will just dive right into it because three minutes is not a long time. Um, <laughs> I know that the board has a resolution tonight about um, school nutrition, and I'm here to urge our school board members to support this resolution. Um, I am a parent at Tanglin, and I'm also on the PTO, and one of the things that I have been doing this year is providing snacks to directly into our classrooms. We had some uh, behavioral situations at the end of last year in my daughter's class, and my very astute fifth grader, now sixth grader, came home and said, um, we were talking about some of these issues they were having on the playground, and she said, you know, Mom, we don't have lunch until 1.30. And we are not allowed to have snacks anymore because my class brings nothing but Takis and Cokes. So by the time we've made it out to the playground, which is right before lunch, we're all hangry. <laughs> and the kids are getting in fights because they are hungry and in a bad mood. Um, and I am in my mid 40s and if I don't eat until 1.30, I am not a nice person either. <laughs> so this really um, spoke to me and I feel like there are resources in our community for solving this issue. And so I started basically just buying snacks and bringing them into the classroom for this one classroom. Um, and I think it made a big difference. The teachers came to me and said that they noticed a difference that when their kids were eating healthy snacks, um, you know, it's a, it's a long time to make it to 1.30 without having food. Um, if you get on the bus at 8 a.m., that means you probably ate breakfast at 7 or 7.30, um, which means you're probably also not hungry for school breakfast at 9, right, when you show up. So you may not eat from 8 in the morning until 1.30, and that's a long time to go for a young little brain. So... Um, I've spoken to um, Hopkins Nutrition about this issue. I've spoken to ICA Food Shelf about this issue. I've spoken to teachers about this issue. And one of the solutions we came up with was to provide snacks directly into the classrooms this year. So um, every classroom has a big box of snacks. And at the varying times, their kids are allowed to go and take a snack. Um, and it helps bridge that gap. And I think that by having, um, knowing that these, these, uh, resources are making a really big difference to the wellness of our kids. It's apropos of the discussion you guys were having at, in the workshop um, to providing wellness resources to our kids that uh, these kids function better and um, learn better and our teachers are able to teach them better um, and the whole wellness circle is, um, is much improved by having nutrition that is available to our children. And we know that resources are hard to come by. Funding is hard to come by. We know that state doesn't adequately fund um, pretty much any element of school Thank these days. Thank you very much. We're at three minutes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this evening. 
So next we'll move on to our reports. We'll start with our student board, re board representatives and Imani, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. My name is Imani. I'm a senior at Hopkins High School and I'm just gonna start with the student board rep updates and then I'll go on to other things happening at the high school. Um, but it's been, there's been a lot happening with the student board recently these past two weeks. Uh, first of all, we spoke with Principal Ballard and we're gonna start having monthly meetings with her at the high school because she was really interested in learning about what the student board does and she never really knew about it before. Um, we're also, as student board reps and other students in the high school, we are helping Principal Ballard and her team edit the high school newsletter that gets sent out to the parents and other community members um, every week, I'm pretty sure. And last week, student board reps, including me, had grade by grade meetings just to talk about what each person was passionate about working on this year and just any concerns or issues that they were having or do not wanna have. So moving on, uh, last week, we've been having community engagement sessions and scholars have been, scholars from grades seven through 12 have been helping other staff members uh, co-facilitate meetings with uh, people, a part of the community to talk about rethinking the school calendar, rethinking school start times, rethinking a space and a place to learn and rethinking grade configurations. I specifically was a part of the Rethinking School Start Times and we've had really amazing conversations with people who are a part of our community and I'm excited for uh, the next virtual meeting on Thursday from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, the last update is more specifically about the high school but the National Honor Society is having a meeting coming up this Thursday morning at 7.15 just to meet the other people who are also a part of NHS. And the uh, Hopkins, Hopkins High School Speaks Out Club might be getting a tour from Kevin Newman of the solar panels on the high school roof. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting, maybe October 15th. Uh, and we also in Hopkins Speaks Out, we have been talking about some concerns over COVID in the high school, uh, specifically at lunch. Um, I'm, I under, we understand that we have two uh, cafeteria sections, so we have the old one and then we have the new cafeteria section. But some of us in the club were thinking of opening the old gym like we used to so that they can be more social distancing mm -hmm. during lunchtime. And because it's been noted that a lot of students aren't necessarily wearing their masks over their nose a lot, we were thinking, this is all just a draft for now, but we were thinking of dress coding students who don't wear their masks appropriately, but it is still just an idea. So this Wednesday we're having our next meeting and we're gonna talk more about it. And that's it. That's a lot of updates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Imani. Any questions or comments from my board colleagues for Imani? I just wanna say how impressed I was when I learned that Imani's been at all three of our community engagement sessions. As a board member, I only attended one, so I had a little complex, because Imani, <laughs> showing up at three, frankly, all four is amazing. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful leadership, thanks Imani. Oscar, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. I'm Oscar Wolf. I'm a junior at Hopkins High School. Um, the first thing I'd like to update on relates to the board's goal of calendar equity. Hmm. As you may know, the Jewish high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur just happened. Uh, they're typically around September. Um, and Jewish students at Hopkins face the same issue that they do pretty much every year. Uh, where various teachers have varying levels of knowledge about Judaism and any religious minority for that matter. Um, so a lot of the teachers that know will accommodate and assign either less work or make work optional or just not assign tests. Uh, but the issue arises when teachers don't, hmm. when teachers just keep the work completely normal um, because Jewish students are not there on those days. Um, and it provides an even, an, an even worse issue for more observant Jews 
uh, because work is prohibited on both of these holidays, mm -hmm. meaning not only is it an inconvenience to, to catch up on work because you're not there, it's actually against the religion. So Jewish students are put into a very difficult situation of do I disobey the religion or do I fall behind in school? And it really is an either or in this situation. Um, and this is by no means a Jewish problem. This is a problem for really every religious minority at Hopkins and every other school for that matter. Uh, but this is very fresh in our minds and I can speak to it firsthand, which is why I brought it up here. Um, and on a much, much lighter note, <laughs> uh, our homecoming week happened. Uh, we had our spirit days where everybody dresses up as a theme for each day. We had some really amazing outfits for that. Uh, we had the pep fest. We had it outside this year due to COVID concerns. We had some really fun performances from our pep band, LMPM, from our cheerleaders, our drum line, our dance team, and the football team even did a collaborative dance with the dance team. <laughs> it's a lot of fun with that. Uh, we, of course, had the homecoming game itself where we did manage to score a touchdown, so <laughs> <laughs> success on that front. And then we had the homecoming dance. And in past years, we have struggled to sell even 100 tickets on that. Mm -hmm. And I may be a little biased as I did help plan it in student council, <laughs> but I would say our turnout of over 800 tickets uh, far surpassed our expectations. Wow. We really attribute that to, number one, the pandemic, of course. Nobody's been to any social events in a really long time. <laughs> and the other thing was we upgraded homecoming from a casual dance to a semi-formal dance. Mm -hmm. So really, really impressive turnout on that. And it went great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oscar. Any comments or questions? Oscar, where was the dance held? The dance was held in the mall of the high school, oh, okay. but it did sort of like spread out sure. to sort of the entrance area-ish. Sure, mm -hmm. okay. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's an outside yeah, place there was, that there was an outdoor we, area. I think the kids call the Bat Cave, or who calls it the Bat Cave? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe the principal calls it the Bat Cave. She parks her car there. So then we use that as a, sort of a mask break area, uh, and lots of um, kids you know, spent lots of time in that outdoor space as well. Oscar, thank you for sharing um, your experiences as a Jewish student with the religious holidays. It's exactly the type of information we need to have and consider as we move toward this goal of calendar equity. And so I really appreciate you bringing that forward. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Grace, we'll pass it to you. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. Um, I am a sophomore at Hopkins. I previously went to North last year. Um, and the main thing that I wanted to touch on was um, something that's pretty recent sports-wise at the school. Um, our volleyball team is very aware of Cancer Awareness Month, and so for their last home game um, tonight at 7 p.m., all of the funds from any concessions that they sell um, and any, like, Hopkins merchandise or, like, any sweatshirts and hats and things like that, um, all the proceeds from this volleyball game are going directly to a breast cancer um, awareness fund program to kind of bring attention to that and help students kind of feel like they're fighting for a cause rather than just like going to a game and having fun. They're also kind of becoming a part of something bigger. Um, and within that, many of our Hopkins varsity team members on the volleyball team are being sponsored either by parents or you know, some of their friends or even staff members at the school. Um, and it's kind of by a basis of $1 per dig that they do, um, or you can just do a flat out fee, and they are expected to raise over $2,000. Mm -hmm. So, wow. pretty good. good. That's wonderful, Great thank idea. you, Grace. Uh -huh. Comments or questions for Grace? That's really, really a wonderful, um, I was gonna say project. It's more of, um, of a, a service that the, the volleyball team is providing. So thank you so much for sharing that. 
appreciate it. Well, so appreciate having you all at the table and um, our student board reps also serve on committees and attend our workshops. And so they are really um, superstars and we could not do this work without their voices. So grateful to have you with us tonight. And next I'll turn it over to Dr. Mary Peary reed for the superintendent's report. Thank you very much, Chair Bouchard. And um, before I get started, um, Oscar and the three of you, if you can think of ideas to provide us um, to help address the calendar equity issue, we would love to hear your concrete ideas, whether it's around you know, um, requiring all adults, all of us as staff to make proper accommodations or whether it's, you know, literally recognizing um, very specific days as non-student contact days, right? So just um, maybe mull over that important issue and, and let us know if you have ideas. And it doesn't have to be now. It could be now or it could be in the future. I, I do have one thing I know for sure that would be helpful. Um, I, uh, a whole calendar of the year where, where any uh, holidays for really any group are, are specifically pointed out that would be available to any teacher or student. Uh, so they could just see, they could just look at the calendar for the week and see, oh, Rosh Hashanah's on Tuesday. Just, just being aware of that, like not even, not even any action in that case, just having a calendar where all of those dates are really easily accessible. I like that idea. We, ha we do have a district equity and inclusion coordinator who very consistently sends um, descriptive emails to all Hopkins staff on um, special days, religious holidays for, you know, all of our religions and, and other, like, um, you know, if it's um, a heritage awareness month. And so the staff do get descriptive emails saying, you know, what today or this month is all about. Um, but I like the idea of an actual calendar that um, explicitly delineates um, where these specific holidays um, and religious observance days are. So I like that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's more about like the history and the traditions with those holidays. It'd be interesting if Dr. Brown could add ways to support our students of those various religions, mm -hmm. cultural groups on those days, you know, whether it's like you said, um, reduced workload um, or, you know, maybe just thinking outside the box on how we can actually adapt that into how we interact with our, our students could be an interesting addition. I like that. I was just looking online and there's some colleges that do a very good job at it. Mm. For instance, Xavier, um, actually has in Louisiana a, um, maybe <laughs> <laughs> um, a few of them okay so but it lists every holiday and then it also um, has a, where it'll say special worship um, so it'll actually list <clears throat> what is actually going to happen with that student that date mm. and then so that's one work restrictions um, to Oscar's point, that is um, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, there's um, some that say meaningful, some that say special worship. Um, it's very, this would be a very good resource for hmm. Dr. Brown to use. That's excellent. Thank you. So um, all ideas welcome. And thank you very much for raising that this evening. Okay, I just have a, a few slides for the superintendent report this evening. So it is um, the sixth week of school, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, we started school on August 30, and I just can't believe that we're already in week six. Like how fast time flies um, is sometimes incomprehensible. Um, and being that we're in week six, that means we're actually more than halfway through our first term, because each of our terms is about nine weeks long. Um, so we are experiencing improved transportation services day by day. So that means our scholars are being picked up in the morning and brought to school so they can have school. And um, our, our, drop, our parent drop-off lines, wow, some of them are very long, but <laughs> they are also um, day by day increasingly efficient. 
Um, lots of staff working hard. Our HR department is working very hard to recruit and hire to fill vacancies. Um, I'm going to spotlight our nutrition services team, which is also really working hard to support our students um, in meal services for breakfast and lunch. And so lots and lots of busy adults and lots of learning um, with our students. Um, so Oscar did provide a, um, a homecoming highlight. And, um, you know, he mentioned that there were um, lots of tickets sold to the dance and lots and lots of junior high and senior high um, kids at the game. I mean, do you remember those stands? They were really full. Um, our junior high kids were just a little bit squirrely, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they were supposed to sit with their parents, but apparently many of them did not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and um, I loved the video of the outdoor pep fest that Kevin Noonan did. So I'll come back to the slide and we'll culminate the report with, with the video because it, it is really awesome. Um, so for a, a scholar highlight, I think in our last report, we focused on kindergartners, and this focuses on older students. And I chose to um, focus this um, spotlight on our older kids, our 7th through 12th graders, who are experiencing Applied Learning Fridays, or fondly known as Flex Fridays. And there's a lot of great things happening with our, our Friday flex schedule and also some things that we're learning along the way um, to provide uh, more personalized support and more structure for staff and for students. So um, our leaders and our teachers are engaging in very intentional ways with the Flex Friday experience. And, you know, there's always room for improvement because um, we are having our students exercise a different skill set by participating in these um, Flex Fridays. So there's lots of self-directed, self-paced learning involved. And um, Dr. Camphy actually sent out in her um, newsletter to staff and families, she identified a number of um, learner outcomes that we are uh, zeroing in on to help our scholars be prepared for college and career environments, which will require them to be self-directed and self-paced in their learning and in their work. So I put a number of those pieces on the slide for you to read through, but um, participating successfully in Flex Fridays does require students to identify where they want more challenge and where they want specific support. Um, requires students to engage in one-on-one um, -on -one coaching or small group experiences where small groups are focused on a particular task, a particular lesson, a particular skill that they're all developing together. So there's um, there's really the, the opportunities for learning um, in new ways and differently on Fridays is great. And I think we just have to continue listening to our students and staff to um, to get it to a point where it's truly being appreciated and, and maximized um, by, by all involved. I did want to um, highlight our nutrition services department because... These individuals, not only were these individuals showing up every day. Do you remember when the governor, you know, um, um, in, had us all engage in a statewide shutdown? But there were some employee groups who served our students and families every day during this time. And our nutrition services <laughs> employees were, um, were some of those staff. And so they just continue to deliver. They have, um, you know, huge smiles on their faces when they're um, when they're serving meals to our students. They keep their kitchens and serving lines very clean and organized. They are preparing interesting and nutritious meals for our students, and they are also doing this d despite being very short staffed. So, um, as a whole team, we're down between five and eight. Um, nutrition services staff, and so sometimes they are they are working harder and 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 more because the whole team 
um, because they don't have a complete team. So I did want to recognize our Director of Nutrition Services, Barb McCurra, and all of the staff for the amazing uh, work that they do to serve our students. And then um, I'm going to try in every update to provide um, sort of a, a snapshot of one of our system goals. This morning during the workshop, we talked about our wellness goal. And so we did learn during the workshop that um, we are um, engaging in a wellness plan that's informed by a wellness task force that started two summers ago. And um, we are also following a framework from, work from the CDC's from the CDC called Whole School, Whole Community, Whole Child Wellness. And our approach um, includes um, SEL, Social Emotional Learning Curriculum for our K-6 students, increased therapy for elementary, so um, therapists from St. David's at all six of our elementary schools, three therapy dogs, um, for staff, we have wellness resources that include uh, mental and physical health activities promoted by our benefits department, one to two wellness champs at each of our sites, and an employee assistance program that offers a number of um, mental health and other um, supports for our staff through insurance. So um, we, we do want to intentionally focus on wellness, and we know that a, a, a great support system is um, not just comprehensive, but also differentiated and personalized because there's a wide range of, of wellness needs that our staff and students will have at various points throughout the year. So we hope that this is something that we can get really good at in Hopkins. And with that, I am going to close and just see if, see if there are any questions. Thank you. Oh, wait, I'm going to go back to the video. Sorry. Oh, good. Yes. Premature so like, closure. Can we watch the video first? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Here we go. So wonderful. Were they dressed by grade? Okay, so the orange yeah. was seniors. The class colors. I'm like, That's yeah. What are the colors Hopkins again? Color. <laughs> what um, are the class colors again? The seniors are orange, juniors are red, and sophomores are yellow. Okay. okay. Vibrant. Very. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mary Peary Reed. Any questions or comments? Well, with that, I would look for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next, I would look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Any discussion? Chair Bouchard. Yes, Director Cool. I just have one question under human resources. Um, there are several resignations under student casual help. What exactly is that? <laughs> we all look, I think they, they We're all looking at Dr. Lightfoot. They're student casual help. So these are, are these casual employees who are actu actually students, Dr. Lightfoot? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm looking at the names and 
I don't recognize any. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are the, I believe, the processing from the Royal Reps from um, previous activity. Okay. Or some, I know we have students who sometimes serve in buildings and grounds during the summer. So to answer your question, yes. That's fine. Thank you. Any additional discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion carries. Next, we'll move to our treasurer's report with Treasurer Adams. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. Uh, we don't have any enrollment numbers yet for this month. Hopefully, I'll have some to report at the uh, next meeting when we get them from the state. But I do have some expenses to report. So uh, expenses of note this time included about 166000 to St. Louis Park Schools for our portion of the adult basic education for last year. So we're still wrapping up some of our uh, year-end expenses for the 2021 school year. Uh, there is a, over $7,000 to Versatrans for bus tracking software support. Um, there was an invoice for $22,873 for ACT tests that we paid for for students to take last spring. $345 for oven maintenance at the concession stand. I was not even aware that there was an oven in the concession stand, so uh, there is, and we maintain it. So. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> Uh, likewise, we, we paid a substantial amount for kitchen hood cleaning at multiple schools in preparation for the beginning of the school year. Uh, we're wrapping up expenses for the HVAC project at the high school for better air quality. And we wrote a check for $739,000 for, for that project. Hopefully we're done with that. Uh, nearly $200,000 for roof repair at uh, West Junior High, or roof maintenance, actually. And we made our uh, contribution to the city of Minnetonka in the amount of $15,000 for utilities for the quarter. So uh, those are some expenses of note. And with that, I move that we approve total disperse disbursements in the amount of $4,768,000 for the period September 8, 2021 through September 27, 2021. Thank you, Treasurer Adams. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the Treasurer's report. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next, we can move into new business, and our first agenda item is policies and first reading. I'll turn it over to Vice Chair Andreessen. Thank you, Chair Bouchard. In our um, policies and first reading section, what we have are uh, policies in our 200 series, which has to do with board issues. And to go into more detail around those, I invite Assistant Superintendent Nick Lightfoot to the table. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. Uh, we do have the series 200, which are the uh, board uh, policies, and these are the specific ones that are due for the three-year review cycle. So the monitoring committee went through all of these in further detail. I will walk through the specific policies and recommendations that were part of each. If there are any questions, um, monitoring committee, please feel free to add additional information, and we can stop after each policy to discuss in more detail. First is 203.6. 203.6 is the consent agenda policy. There was a recommendation from the committee um, to modify the language in paragraph two just to reflect the general statement of policy. You'll see that modification there. Otherwise, there were no recommendations from MSBA related to any specific changes, and that minor change was uh, recommended from the policy monitoring committee. Questions about 203.6? I think we can continue. All right. 
Next one that we have is 210, conflict of interest. Um, this is an annual review policy under 210. Um, it is the conflict of interest with school board members. No changes were recommended. Questions, discussion, anything further on 210? I think we're good, thank you. All right. Policy 250. 250 is school board elections. Um, no recommended changes at this time for school board elections. Um, questions, discussion, further input on 250. Thank you. All right. 251, <coughs> appointed board officials. Uh, we said general reference with the three-year cycle on this. Um, any questions, conversation, discussion on 251? We did mention during review that this um, was used when uh, Director Cool was appointed and thought that the policy served us well. So. Excellent. <laughs> All right. 253, board member compensation and expenses. Questions, discussions on that? Looks like we're good. Great. 254 is the uh, board member and board employees insurance policy that's required by statute to offer um, life insurance to board members. Any questions or discussions on that? 255 is the school board legislative program. Um, no changes recommended. Any questions, conversation on that? It's a bunch of easy ones tonight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a comment <clears throat> on that. Um, I noticed it was first adopted in 1985. Mm. <clears throat> that must have been the genesis of our LAC, I would imagine. So 36 years, I'm quite impressed. Hmm. It is, oh. we have one of the strongest LACs in the state. So we're told. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. And we believe that, right? I do. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Absolutely. <clears throat> Last policy for the evening. Again, no changes recommended. Um, school board and superintendent performance evaluation and planning. Comments, questions, discussion? There we go. Like we're good. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Lightfoot. So I would look for a motion that the board approve the above policies in first reading. Further, the board directs the administration to prepare the policies with suggested revisions <coughs> for approval and second reading at the next meeting as part of consent. I so move. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the policies and prepare the policies with suggested revisions for consent. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next, I will turn it back to Dr. Lightfoot for our substitute use and pay agenda item. Sure. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be in front of you with this. Um, this sometimes is an item that is placed on the consent agenda. Um, however, given the context of what we've been trying to navigate and work through, we felt that it really was an opportunity to dialogue with the board about the um, labor experiences that not only Hopkins is having, and I know that you are all acutely aware of, but to bring again the level of awareness of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to staff and how we're trying to look at programming um, within Hopkins Public Schools. So what we tried to present in this set of information for you is a picture of 2018, looking at that data set of sub-usage from 2018. Then, of course, the pandemic years and where we find ourselves as we start the school year of 2021. And as we take a look at that information, I think quite clearly from that, um, specifically what we wanted to do was just even take that snapshot of September to show you what it was like September of 2018 and a 90% plus fill rate whenever we had a substitute <laughs> and needed a sub. And to take the comparable experience of a 70% fill rate, knowing full well what that does to our buildings and looking for how they can accommodate the need in any given time for the number of illnesses that we are experiencing and for the lack of available individuals to provide substitute services. 
So we know that both of those are contributing to what we are experiencing on a daily basis. And first of all, an incredible thanks to all of our administrators, all of our staff members who are willing to step forward to help each other in their time of need. Um, I was discussing with the Education Association today in our teacher negotiations, and they were talking about how they are working with one another that if there is a need for a sub, they're even starting to dialogue about how one another can help cover in these cases. Mm -hmm. So the incredible amount of energy and effort that goes into making this real um, is just a first note of thanks. On that, um, what we're additionally trying to do is to look at how we manage um, most of the time that when we can't fill comes usually in the early mornings when people will try to give it their all, but they can't get in that day for whatever reason. Um, so usually what we're trying to do is to address those by hiring what we call perm subs. Those subs that are permanently housed in a building, um, we're trying to look at can we get two in each elementary and then two to four potentially in our secondary programs. Um, we are trying to move that initial number of four up to a number of 20. Um, and as we look at that, of course, that does have some budget implications. Mm. But as we've looked throughout the metro area, trying to find a labor pool is very, very challenging on any random need basis. And the way that most districts are trying to address that is to look at permanent placements within buildings so that individuals are there to address the need in proactive measures rather than reactive measures early in the morning or late in the evening when people usually will fill out those substitute need slips that then tried to get sourced. So that's an ongoing energy and effort. The other one, and what is up in front of the board for you this evening, is the rate of pay increase. We've looked at the metro area database. The um, Minnesota Association of School Personnel Administrators keeps a database on all the sub rates in the state of Minnesota. That's what we utilize to look at the average rates of pay that we're offering. As you see in the executive summary, I think it's around 147 per day. We're looking to up the PERM sub rate um, and as well the general sub rates to go a bit above that. Our look with the PERM sub rate was to get that on average for an eight hour day over $20 an hour so that we could look at that as a competitive wage to be attractive. Um, to try and draw more individuals into those positions as we continually look to increase that number. So that's the general set of information. The items that are here in front of you tonight for board consideration are the increase in the rate of pay to help and assist with that effort. <clears throat> and I would be available for any questions or further dialogue as it would be helpful. Chair Bouchard? Yes, Director Peterson. Um, Dr. Lightfoot, I just have a question on our use of the external vendor with teachers on call. Is that for all of these different roles? So when we're talking about a PERM substitute, we would still be con contracting that through teachers on call? Yes. Um, okay, and when, we, when we're paying through teachers on call, do, the, do we get to select our rates? So when we do a rate increase, it's gonna show up and we're gonna pay more, so ideally that means we'll get more subs through teachers on call than, or, yeah. you know, and I see that they're taking a 28% fee. I just would love a, like a breakdown of the economics there for our, sure. for firms um, in yeah. particular. If you think, if you think on a couple measures, um, so first of all, yes, we do set our rates. So we locally set those rates in Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And then after we set those rates, then teachers on call looks at that percentage, which is the 28%. The individuals are employees then of Teachers on Call. Um, and then we work with them through the invoicing after we have the level of service. If we were to look at comparable services in Hopkins, our benefit package and our average percentages, as you all know from the budgeting, are around 36%. So when we think about the, the cost and the components of the way that we're looking at this and the aggregated labor pool that is to a benefit with a larger group with teachers on call. Um, that relationship has proven to, over time, help us increase those rates of fill, even in times when it is quite difficult to find subs. That larger pool does allow for that. Can we also look internally to hire our own? Yes, we can. Um, but knowing right now that the real concentration of where individuals are is within teachers on call, that's where we've started. 
If we can't get enough individuals through that for our perm subs, we will also look to hire internal to Hopkins or within Hopkins as well. All right, that's perfect. That, I didn't wanna ask and not and put you on the spot, but that 36% to the 28% was exactly <laughs> kind of what I was yep. what I was getting at, and I love that you had those numbers. Chair Bouchard. Yes. If I could add to that. Yeah. Uh, Director O'Shea, um, or Petters Peterson. I'm all um, of those things. Okay. <laughs> uh, I had the same concern. I was on the board when we went to Teachers on Call several years ago. And I was wondering, what's gonna be the experience? Will we get better fill rates? Will we get more uh, quality candidates? And we did an audit the year after uh, we had completed our first year. And uh, yeah, we had higher fill rates. Uh, now, given the current situation, the current environment, I'm not sure if we would or not, but um, it also alleviated our staff internally of a lot of extra work that they had to do. Mm -hmm. So um, we were able to reduce our own internal staff for doing substitution uh, locations. So um, it, it did benefit us financially to, to make that move. Thank so. you. Any other questions for uh, Assistant Superintendent Lightfoot? Chair Bouchard. Yes. It's not a question, but just a comment that um, I've seen firsthand um, how great having permanent subs in the building is for, um, in particular, the students. They develop a relationship with that person, and so that normal kind of behavioral adjusting that happens in any classroom setting when a sub walks in just isn't present with those permanent subs because there's already that relationship developed. So I think it's great that we're looking at expanding that. Very advantageous for those subs too, to be able to have that relationship with the building, right? And the students. Absolutely, um, yeah. As a former sub, I, <laughs> I speak from experience. <laughs> well, thank you. Any additional questions? All right, with that, I would um, look for a motion that the board approve the recommended rate increases to address decreased absence fill rates and staffing shortages within the district and across the state. Okay, so I have a motion, is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the rate increases. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And if you know of anyone who would be interested at all, <laughs> please do not hesitate to have them reach out to me directly. Absolutely, thank you very much. We'll move to our next agenda item, which is our MSBA delegate assembly resolution. So first I'd like to set a little bit of context around what the MSBA delegate assembly is. So um, the Hopkins School Board is part of the Minnesota School Boards Association and each December representatives from across the state, from school boards across the state, come together at the delegate assembly and vote on resolutions that eventually become um, the platform, the legislative platform for MSBA. And um, our own Director Adams will be one of the voting members. Um, how many times have you done the delegate assembly? Um. I think it's been nine years. Wow. I, I crashed the first year <laughs> just because I wanted to <laughs> see what it was all about. So. I didn't then, even know you could do that. Well, if you're bold enough. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get to vote, though. So. <laughs> uh, well, you were a witness. So that's, yeah. That's good. Well, you've been a delegate, too, though. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, for two years. As has uh, Director Andreessen. Mm -hmm. so. It was online, of course, last year, so that was an interesting experience. So um, our LAC has been working on some resolutions, um, one around school nutrition that was authored by Vice Chair Andreessen, and I know that our LAC has done a, a lot of work on it as well. Um, one on the proposed constitutional amendment, the page amendment. And then um, I've been describing this as I sort of slid in at the last minute, like um, doing my homework at the very last minute. But what happened is I saw the, the opportunity to put forward a resolution 
um, to address pay for our education support professionals. And um, when I checked with the folks at MSBA, they said there had not been a resolution to that effect yet. So I um, wanna thank the LAC for, for reviewing my resolution really at the last minute um, so that we could bring it before the board. So um, our work tonight is to um, vote to approve or not approve these resolutions as a board and then they'll be submitted to MSBA for consideration um, for the, during the delegate assembly in December. So we'll go through them one by one. Um, I think Vice Chair Andreessen, if we could start with the, the school nutrition resolution, um, we can all pull it up. And if you want to give us any additional context or answer board member questions, then kind of procedurally what needs to happen is you would read the resolution and then we would do a roll call vote on it. So we're gonna give um, Clerk Peterson a workout here with this agenda <laughs> item. So read the entire resolution? I believe procedurally that's what has to happen. So it's, yeah, it's a big one, right? Okay, it will not let me um, download it from the board packet. Oh, okay. But I can, I've got it. Were there any I changes made from what I submitted, Elise? I don't think there were, but okay. Then I can just read it as it exists in, on my computer. Okay. Um, Did board members have any um, questions about the resolution before we proceed with the reading? So this, um, a version of this was submitted to last year's um, delegate assembly, and there was a lot of discussion around it at that um, at that uh, meeting. It was not adopted based on MSBA um, recommendation to not be adopted. And what happens is if a resolution is adopted, it becomes part of the MSBA platform. So they will work with the state legislature to get bills passed. Um, so this one, I have adapted it based on some really great movement at the federal level to um, pass a, a bill called the Summer Meals, uh, the Universal School Meals Program Act. Um, so that's just a little context there, which means that the uh, federal government would be funding breakfast um, lunch and a snack, which one of our community members um, spoke to um, at the beginning of our meeting um, for, for schools. So the resolution is um, concerning fully funding school nutrition programs. Whereas in the best of times, many families struggle to gain access to quality nutrition in their communities. It is often through school meals that students enjoy food security. The federal government has recognized this unique position of public schools to provide the necessary food security in our communities during this time of economic upheaval by continuing to renew the extension of the summer meals program throughout the school year since the pandemic impacted school districts across the nation in 2019. Whereas the success and necessity of this extension are reflected in the Universal School Meals Program Act, which is moving through both the US House and Senate and has support from local and national education organizations. As public education leaders, we also support this bill. Whereas it is imperative that we have a robust <coughs> school nutrition program that does not rely on parents paying fees, nor parental applications for food benefits. Such a vital program to community health cannot be a fee-based program, as those programs rely solely on the economic security of residents. Eliminating fees for school meals would alleviate many of the issues we see in nutrition programs. Lunch shaming, confusion navigating the system, fear stigma associated with the application, undue paperwork and administerial burden on districts and families, and increase access to food security across the state. 
whereas we urge our partners in the U.S. House and Senate to pass the Universal School Meals Program Act while asking the Minnesota legislature to explore state-specific needs such as reimbursement tied to school meal applications. Whereas parents and school districts experience the undue burden of applications, districts across the state have seen a reduction in our education benefits application completion. Example, Hopkins saw a reduction of more than 10% of our ADM or 700 fewer applications than in 2019. This reduction in completed applications translates into a loss of 30 FTEs for the district. We urge the state legislature to sever education funding streams, examples compensatory funding, MARS, et cetera, from this application and devise a new model. Several already exist, Medicaid, Community Income Index, Income Tax, et cetera. Amend HF1144 to reflect the need to sever school funding from these applications and devise a new model, establishing a task force to develop a model that works for all districts for calculating need-based funding. Here's a link to a tool that explains alternatives to meal applications for compensatory funding. Other options to applications are here. You can select Minnesota to see what we already do or look into other states' solution. Here's a link to other models used when a state and or district adopts the community eligibility provision. Whereas school nutrition programs are fundamental to education, the research is clear educational outcomes manifested as better reading and math scores, lower grade retention rates, improve significantly when students experience food stability. Very few people contest the benefits of the school nutrition program. Where we fall short is investing in this shared value. Whereas for too long we have relied on a system of meal benefits that is not working, relying on parents to fill out applications while ignoring the fact that it is the only educational benefit in our public school system that we make students pay for. This fee for meals results in a deterioration of the crucial relationship between schools and families. Whereas fully funded school nutrition programs are a great equalizer. Even those students who qualify for free and reduced programs are reluctant to participate due to stigma. In Hopkins, we saw our universal breakfast program grow from 10 to 12% participation to 45 to 50% participation when we shifted to breakfast in the classroom offered to all students. Whereas shifting our model to a fully funded one has other benefits to districts. It saves money, allowing more dollars to go to quality food because it stabilizes the budget and staffing resulting in less administerial burden within the program. Whereas in order to keep our school nutrition departments responsive and robust, we must shift our model from the uncertainty of fee-based revenue to the stability of government-funded revenue. Our families need to know that they have access to quality nutrition regardless of their current economic or application status. And our staff need to know that they can continue providing quality nutrition to the families they serve. Minnesotans need to know that their tax dollars are supporting the future health and prosperity of the state. Therefore, be it resolved that Hopkins School Board urges the legislature to fully fund public schools, school nutrition departments, so all Minnesota families have equitable access to healthy meals, contributing to overall community health and food security. Thank you, Vice Chair Andreessen. I would look for a motion that the board approve the resolution concerning fully funding school nutrition programs. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to <coughs> approve the resolution. And we'll move to um, Clerk Peterson for the roll call vote. Director Adams. Aye. Director Andreessen. Aye. Chair Bouchard. Aye. Director Kahn. Aye. Director Cool, Aye. And I, Director Peterson, aye. <laughs> we have six <laughs> ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Thank you to Vice Chair Andreessen and our LAC for all of the work that you put into this important resolution. 
So next we'll move to the resolution concerning the proposed state of Minnesota constitutional amendment. Um, and I'm wondering, Director Adams, would you be willing to read this one? Uh, let me see, how long is that one? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I'm like, I think Vice Chair Andreessen needs a break from the reading. <laughs> Not to assume, I, shouldn't, I should have asked you first. Uh, <laughs> let me page down here. And um, this one's just oh, yeah. a page and it has bullets. <laughs> yeah, this should be easy. All right. <clears throat> Uh, this is a resolution regarding the proposed state of Minnesota constitutional amendment to address the achievement gap as put forward by Supreme Court Justice Alan Page and Federal Reserve Bank President Neil Kashkari. Whereas the proposed language would replace Article 13, Section 1 of Minnesota's Constitution in its entirety and reads, equal right to public education, to quality of public education. All children have a fundamental right to a quality public education that fully prepares them with the skills necessary for participation in the economy, our democracy and society, as measured against the uniform achievement standards set forth by the state. It is a paramount duty of the state to ensure quality public schools that fulfill this fundamental right. Whereas it would replace our current amendment, which has been part of our state constitution since 1857, which reads, uniform system of public schools. Stability of a Republican form of government depending mainly upon the intelligence of the people. It is the duty of the legislature to establish a general and uniform system of public schools. The legislature shall make provisions by such provisions by taxation or otherwise, as will secure a thorough and efficient system of public schools throughout the state. Whereas, along with MSBA, Education Minnesota, lawmakers and community groups, Hopkins School Board appreciates that education and the disparate impact it has on our communities is taking center stage through this conversation. Whereas, as educational leaders, Agree, we agree with the broader goal of this amendment to close the achievement gap. Hopkins Public Schools being one of the first districts in the state to initiate collaborative work to address this issue through Reimagine Minnesota. Whereas this proposed amendment to the Minnesota State Constitution elevates our collective conversation by inserting more aspirational and current language into our constitution establishes education as a fundamental right and a paramount duty of the state, initiates a statewide conversation about the disparities inherent in our educational system, the outcomes of which are determined by a social system based on race and socioeconomic status, inspires us to grapple with the civil rights issue that it is a moral imperative of our time, has the potential to bring together all of Minnesota around the issue of equity in education and lends the weight of the Constitution to the recommendations of Reimagine Minnesota, ensuring that all districts work toward this common goal. Whereas Hopkins School Board, along with other educational leaders in the state, projects the following unintended consequences that have not been adequately addressed by the authors, including removal of taxation language, removes school districts' entitlement to tax dollars, thus opening up the state to widespread use of public dollars by private entities, vouchers, and further defunding of public schools. Other states that have made this change, Florida, Louisiana, and Washington, show alarming trends in new laws that privatize education, schools receiving public funds that select which families they will serve, and the defunding of public schools that do serve all families, generating a system of haves and have-nots that perhaps a uniform language in our constitutional constitution safeguards against, inserting the, quote, standards of measurement language into the Constitution, codifies testing as teaching and removes the ability of schools to innovate and meet the unique needs of their communities replacing general and uniform with quality 
may be replacing vague language with more of the same, thus forcing the courts to interpret. Case law has been established in Minnesota around general and uniform. The new language would reset the case law, thus miring school districts in costly and lengthy proceedings. Whereas the Hopkins School Board believes that, the Minnesota, that Minnesota's public schools need to change. The state cannot continue to fail large groups of our students. That is why we take this proposed amendment and the conversation it inspires seriously. We look forward to the work to refine this amendment and reinvest and reimagine Minnesota to ensure that public education is a, quote, paramount duty of this state and that all families experience a quality educational experience. Therefore, be it resolved, Hopkins School Board does not support the proposed state constitutional amendment in its current form, while maintaining our commitment to a world-class educational experience for all. Thank you, Director Adams. I would look for a motion that the board approve the resolution concerning the proposed state of Minnesota constitutional amendment. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I'll just offer my two, two bits on this. Um, I, I think it's good to introduce this, well, to introduce the amendment at the, uh, at the delegate assembly, just to get the discussion moving. I don't agree with this approach to getting educational equity uh, within the state um, for a lot of the reasons that are identified in the, in the uh, resolution. And I've had conversations <laughs> with uh, uh, former Justice Page and uh, uh, Neil, the director, uh, Neil Kashkari, where I think we're replacing vague language with even vaguer language. I had the opportunity to listen to the, uh, uh, the, ar the final arguments in the, uh, uh, what's, the what's the case? Uh, Cruz-Guzman case mm -hmm. that was before the state Supreme Court. And it was pretty clear to me that neither the, the uh, plaintiff or the defendant which was the state of Minnesota, could identify what an adequate education was. And I'm even more distressed in thinking that they would even be able to identify what a quality education is. So I think it's just, uh, I, I'm, people are coming from a good, good place in their heart, but I don't think it's gonna resolve any of our issues. And what we still have to do, even if we pass some constitutional amendment like this, is do some of the main steps that are identified in the Reimagine Minnesota. There's nine identified concrete things that uh, school districts can do to improve education. And they're still gonna have to be done no matter what the constitution says. So uh, I, th I think it's more important for us to focus on those steps rather than the vague language of, of the Constitution. So in, in essence, I support this, this amendment or this uh, resolution. Thank you, Director Adams. Um, you know, we and Hopkins are not alone when it comes to our concerns about this constitutional amendment. I had the opportunity to speak to members of the coalition to increase teachers of color and American Indian teachers in Minnesota. And um, the authors of the amendment went to that group for their support. They expressed many of the same concerns that are contained in this resolution. Um, you know, that the amendment really doesn't go far enough if we're really looking to um, eliminate these disparities, echoing the concerns about vouchers and the eventual defunding of our public school districts. And you know they offered these um, suggestions to the authors as well, but the, the authors haven't you know made changes or made any moves right. to to address these concerns. So um, just wanted to add that bit of context. Any further discussion? So we have a motion and a second to approve the resolution concerning the proposed state 
of Minnesota Constitutional Am Amendment, and we'll move to Clerk Peterson for the vote. Director Adams. Aye. Vice Chair Andreessen. Aye. Chair Bouchard. Aye. Director Kahn. Aye. Director Cool. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Thank you, Clerk Peterson. We have six ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Next, we'll move to the resolution for targeted funding to districts in order to increase compensation for education support professionals. And again, I want to um, thank the LAC for reviewing this on Friday. There were a few questions that um, Catherine Callahan sent to me that the LAC had, so I wanted to address those um, before I read the resolution. Um, so one of them was the, the fact that the ability of districts outstate included to be able to afford the $20 minimum hourly pay for a paraprofessional, and I'm assuming that question means all of the support staff included in the resolution, that that would be um, difficult for some districts, and I absolutely agree. In fact, that's why I'm bringing the resolution forward um, to help provide a mechanism for districts to be able to afford the $20 minimum, uh, which is like currently being advocated for by Education Minnesota. So the $20 minimum was not an um, arbitrary number. It's what Education Minnesota is advocating for. And um, there are districts who will not be able to pay for that. And we need some sort of mechanism to, to be able to, um, to elevate this pay. Um, another concern brought forward was that funding through a grant program um, which may be more palatable for legislators is not stable funding. Um, I absolutely agree. And then there was a, a kind of a sub concern there that some districts can afford to pay the higher wages without the grants that are um, proposed in the resolution. I agree. Um, and that's why I inserted the need-based language um, into the qualification for the proposed grant program. Of course, we want funding to be stable, um, and we are also realists. And if we're looking for um, a mechanism to respond to this urgent need, um, this, is one, this is one possibility. And um, there, the third issue that was brought forward is there may be issues around equalization of pay between paraprofessionals in early childhood and child care providers. And I completely agree. Um, so this pay equalization for our early childhood staff and child care providers was part of the LAC's platform last year. And um, I would absolutely encourage the LAC to include that in the platform again. We need to be um, advocating for um, the elevation and equalization of pay across all of our employee groups. Um, and so, so I absolutely support that. So with that, let me try to find the resolution now. Okay, so. Do you, do you get to read this one? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I should All have right. had a drink of water first. <laughs> the resolution for targeted funding to districts in order to increase compensation for education support professionals. For the purposes of this resolution, education support professionals are defined according to the National Education Association as clerical services, custodial and maintenance services, food services, health and student services, paraprofessionals, security services, skilled trades, technical services, and transportation services. Whereas education support professionals are currently amongst the lowest compensated employees in school districts in Minnesota, they are also disproportionately BIPOC. Whereas districts throughout the state are currently experiencing a severe shortage of education support professionals. Whereas we need a long-term solution to staffing shortages and race-based inequities when it comes to our valued education support professionals. Whereas education support professionals staffing shortages existed before the pandemic and have been exacerbated by the socioeconomic conditions surrounding COVID-19. Whereas increasing compensation for these positions would make it easier for school districts to recruit and retain talented student-centered employees. Whereas it is currently difficult for some public school districts in Minnesota to increase pay for their education support professionals 
because state funding for public education has not kept pace with inflation. Whereas continued low wages for education support professionals are exacerbating the racial wealth gap. Whereas Minnesota has one of the worst racial wealth gaps in the nation. Whereas increasing compensation for education support professionals is one concrete step the Minnesota legislature can take to address the racial wealth gap within the context of public education. Be it resolved, the Hopkins School Board urges the legislature to provide targeted funding to districts in order to increase compensation for education support professionals to at least $20 per hour. A proposed approach is for the legislature to create a need-based grant program for districts that are willing to strategically implement a $20 minimum wage for education support professionals. So I would look for a motion that the board approve the resolution for targeted funding to districts in order to increase compensation for education support professionals. So moved. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Any discussion? Chair Bouchard. Yes. I would like to make um, my board colleagues aware that I am abstaining from the vote on this particular resolution because I am currently working in Hopkins Public Schools as a paraprofessional. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Clerk Peterson. Director Adams. Aye. Chair Bouchard. Aye. Director Kahn. Aye. Director Cool. Aye. Director Peterson. Aye. Thank you, Clerk Peterson. We have six ayes, zero nays. Motion carries. Oh, wow. That was a lot of reading. <laughs> um, <laughs> <clears throat> It was worth it. So the next step is that we will inform um, the MSBA representatives that these resolutions have full Hopkins School Board support and they'll be brought forward to the MSBA Delegate Assembly. And then um, Steve will update us on, on how it goes. <laughs> well, are you going to be a delegate this year too? No, I'm not. Oh, you aren't. I oh. know. Okay. I'm kind of regretting. I'm, Bummer. Yeah, I'm having um, FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> the student board reps are like, oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> with that, let's move to our board member reports. <laughs> Chair Bouchard. Yes, Director Adams. I'll, I'll give my report here. Great. Um, uh, September 17th, uh, since we last met, I uh, attended the AM, well, virtually attended the AMSD meeting and heard our annual presentation by Bill Morris and Peter Leatherman, which is always informative yeah, of, of Morris Leatherman surveys. And um, they give a very immediate snapshot of what's going on within the state, uh, especially regards uh, educational issues. And I would urge people to go to the AMSD website. You can download their presentation. It's there. But... Um, they said we're, became, we're becoming increasingly uh, bifurcated in our populace in the state, uh, moving more and more to the extremes, which is disappointing. But, uh, September 24th, I attended the homecoming football game. Mm -hmm. I always try and make it to that. It's always fun to see all the energy there. And then I, but I had to leave at halftime. Well, first of all, I missed the touchdown. <laughs> I got there too late, oh, so no. I didn't see the, the sole touchdown, and uh, it was 35 to 7, I think, at halftime when I left, or 23, 23 to 7, ended up being 35 to 7, but then left to uh, join the Tanglin Parents at ta Perrin, Parents Night Out for the Tanglin Parents at uh, Boulevard, so um, that was a good opportunity to mingle with some of our or a constituents there. And then the following night, I attended the, uh, w with my wife, uh, attended the Eisenhower class of 1981 reunion hmm. that was at the Burl Oaks Country Club out in, uh, is it Maple Plain? I don't know. It's, it's somewhere out west. But uh, that was, that class was the last year uh, hmm 
that anyone graduated from what was Eisenhower High School. So Eisenhower High School was only in existence for, I think, about eight years and uh, maybe less than that, and uh, merged back with what was Lindbergh at the time in 1982. So um, it was kind of a wrinkle in time that, uh, that Eisenhower existed. And it was in this building. So, uh, but it was fun to see some of these people, none of whom I recall, but my wife, of <laughs> course, uh, <laughs> having been their teacher and advisor in uh, many, many areas, uh, got, to, got to see them. And as well as the, uh, the former principal of Eisenhower, Tom Bauman, and uh, Adrian Bouchard, who was the French teacher at the time. So who is not my dad? Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I get that a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so uh, that was a good time. And then September 29th, which was what last Wednesday, Thursday. Got my flu shot at the high school. There was a flu shot clinic going on up at the uh, Lindbergh Center, so I attended that. And then another AMSD meeting uh, within two weeks uh, was last Friday. The presentation there was from uh, some people from Pelsby, the Professional Education Standards uh, Licensing Standards Board and uh, presented mostly talking about uh, tiered licensure and the challenges that they're having implementing it, keeping it implemented. So um, it was worthwhile. And um, I would like to uh, just mention that I saw yesterday in uh, the, uh, the business section of the Minneapolis paper that our superintendent has been a uh, appointed to the board of vocal lessons. So mm -hmm. that was uh, interesting to see. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very ominous. <laughs> <laughs> vocal lessons is a great organization. I've attended many of their, their choir concerts over the years. And the, I don't know if Philip Brunel is the CEO, but the head, yeah. the head guy in charge, his grandson, attends Glen Lake. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, no kidding. I used to run into him occasionally at my dry cleaners, so that's my other claim to fame. Um, <laughs> then i also like to mention that uh, Jim Hay Bison uh, lost his uh, bet with the students at Tanglin, mm -hmm. uh, or with the PTO, and he's going to have to get a tattoo on his forearm. So... Uh, they, pride, they raised right? they, they raised fifty thousand dollars, which he apparently had some doubts whether they could do, and they did, and so he'll be getting a tattoo shortly. <laughs> and then finally, I would just like to recognize uh, John Engelbart. I did not know John, although I know people who did, but he was a uh, studio arts teacher in Hopkins, st who started in 1950 took a break because he got drafted into the Marines um, for the, the Korean War, and, but came back and taught studio arts in Hopkins for 50 years. Wow. Really hard to imagine that anyone can do that for that long anymore. But um, his obituary was in last Sunday's paper. He was 93 years old. Hmm. And uh, we thank him for his service and uh, Give our condolences to his family. Mm -hmm. That's my report. Thank you. Other board member reports. Chair Bouchard, I have a yes. quick one. Director Khan. I had the pleasure to attend a community engagement center where Imani was, mm -hmm. and of course our superintendent. And it was such a pleasure to see that um, it was so wonderfully organized with breakout groups. Everyone was offering their opinions. And then everyone gathered back together and shared uh, what they had uh, talked about. And I just really like the fact that we have taken the initiative to involve the community. And I think you could call it, it's, it's like 
a holistic way to, hmm. uh, you know, address our education. So I think it's great that we got to do that, and it was wonderful meeting so many different people. Hmm. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you for being there. Chair Bouchard. Yes. Dr. Um, so I, I realized, as Director Adams was talking, how long it's been since we've actually been together. It's been like three weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had a, more, I guess, than I thought I was going to have. So um, I did attend the Golden Valley Business um, Council meeting this, I guess, at, towards the end of September, um, which is usually mostly just me providing an update. But in this particular meeting, one of the people asked me about how our contract with Lake Country Transportation was going. And I was amazed <laughs> that anybody outside of the people in this room knew we had a new transportation provider. So I got a chance to share, um, you know, some of the things that Dr. Mary Perry Reed had shared with us about, you know, the CEO stepping up and, you know, really driving buses as needed um, and some of our challenges, but also um, their ability to address those. So that was very interesting. I didn't, I didn't see that question coming. <laughs> um, Meadowbrook had its annual carnival, which is usually in the spring, this fall on September 17th. Um, it was a joy for me as a parent of a fourth and fifth grader to stand there and have no idea where my children were for a good like 45 <laughs> minutes to an hour. Um, it was held outside in the fall for the very first time. So it occurred to me as I was standing there childless for a long time, that this was the very first Meadowbrook Carnival for our kindergartners, our first graders, mm. and our second graders. Mm. So because the 2019 or 20, was it 2020? 2020 Carnival, yeah, so it was never done. And so um, a lot of our kiddos had never had the opportunity to attend. And so it was very fun. Um, the amount of people there was mind blowing. Um, I think everybody was just super excited to be back together. Um, I also was able to watch the League of Women Voters Forum um, that was held uh, last week, two weeks ago, I don't remember. Um, and I urge any of our constituents to watch that. I thought it was really well done in a fun and different format and um, super educational for me. And then I also attended an engagement session yesterday um, and it just was really excited and motivated by the positivity that came out of those conversations, um, the problem solving, the um, and really the desire to listen and understand and, and even evolve thinking in just these small breakout rooms. So it was an awesome experience. Thank you. That was the Golden Valley League of Women Voters, I'm assuming? It was, no, it was the... Hopkins, Minute, Perry, the one that the oh, Hopkins okay, School yeah. District, yeah, so okay, right. it's very, there's a lot of them. It was on Monday, yeah. mm -hmm. Monday the 20th. Monday mm -hmm. the 20th? That's right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Chair Bouchard. Director Cool. So my update tonight, I, I do have a few things that I've been doing, but I'm going to kind of put that on hold and not talk about that tonight. Um, you, you know, as a parent, we always think about what would happen if there was an emergency at school. And it's very interesting that over the last six days, um, I have seen two medical emergencies firsthand happen at our high school and see how response, um, really how the response happens, um, both externally and internally, um, and specifically at the high school. And I must tell you, for all the parents that are there, um, you can, you can have confidence in our high school and the emergency training that our teachers and staff have. Um, I have to tell you that on a personal note, I saw um, assistant principals and principals being um, involved within five minutes of a health emergency. And it's, um, it's quite amazing to see how all the different levels of individuals were able to come together without, you, you know, without any, um, you know, planning because um, both of these events happened randomly at odd times of the day. And I must tell you that the way that they have worked um, and had worked with the emergency services, both the Minnetonka Police, um, Hennepin um, County, 
ambulance service and also the fire department was amazing. And it just has to be noted that the time and the energy that our school staff puts in to these type of um, trainings and conversations, it's quite amazing as a parent. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all of you that know who you are because it's a very important thing that you do. Mm -hmm. Thank it. you. I'm not surprised to hear that and it is so good to hear that mm -hmm. and wishing your family well. Um, any other board member reports? Chair Bouchard. Yes. I just have a quick update from District 287. Yes. Um, we have been going through our um, biweekly board meetings, but the last one was um, in particular quite special because we got to go through a process that the District 287 did with their staff at the their kickoff week where they um, did they watched a video about um, kind of the, the history of um, redlining and um, the impacts that that has had on um, communities of color up to the present day and generational inequities that keep being perpetuated. Um, and then we went through a process of being placed into um, cohorts where we could discuss more in depth the implications of that, not just on our lived experience, but on our um, the students who show up into the District 287 buildings. It was really a, a great experience, and um, it was led by um, one of the, the year of learning, the first cohort that has gone through the process of um, working with Resme Menachem around um, his book, My Grandmother's Hands. And um, I have just started the year two um, cohort um, and am really excited to um, do that work and go through that process. It's very illuminating and I'm, I'm really thankful that they opened it up to board members to be able to go through that process. So. Wow, that sounds like it was wonderful. And I'm thinking um, how powerful it would be to do something similar at our board retreat in January. So let's, let's keep talking about that. Yeah. Wonderful. Wow, well, we've been up to a lot here as a team. Um, I just have a couple brief, brief things to mention. So um, we had a great presentation on wellness, holistic wellness during the workshop. One of the ways that we are t attending to the wellness of our scholars in the online Royal Academy um, is with a partnership through Second Harvest and FAM's Rice Bowl is the, the restaurant provider for um, this month, sorry, last month and this month. Um, and so I checked out the food truck that comes on um, Tuesdays and um, my scholar is currently doing the online at Royal Distance Learning Academy and um, was able to try the food and it's really amazing. And so I wanted to um, express my gratitude to our nutrition team for putting together that partnership and of course the great work of Second Harvest and FAM's Rice Bowl that just create these amazing, these amazing meals for our scholars. Um, I had a wonderful time participating in the first engagement session around redefining school parameters um, that was online. And um, I agree with the comments about the format being very effective and a place for um, engagement to happen, of course, and also growth um, in my own understanding as a board member of what, what our community is experiencing. And, um, and what community members' priorities are with some of these really big questions and decisions that we're gonna be tackling this year. And finally, I wore my sticker um, so that I would remember <laughs> to <laughs> tell you all that I voted today. Um, so early voting is open at your city hall. Of course, the Hopkins School District spans multiple cities, and so the best thing to do is get in touch with your city hall. I voted um, at Minnetonka City Hall. It was a really smooth process, and so 
great to to vote for the future of our community and and to get that done before election day you can kind of like check it off your list and know that you have you have done your civic duty to ensure that our school district and our city structures um, serve all of our community members okay anything else Chair Bouchard, yes. I, I just remembered one thing. That, sure. Um, it was announced at the last AMSD meeting, well, last Friday, that, well, every year AMSD awards something called the Friend of Education Award. And typically it's always been to a legislature, legislator. And um, we broke that string a few years ago when we didn't find a deserving legislator. <laughs> so, oh, no. so Tom Melcher got the award that year, a longtime uh, employee of, of the Minnesota Department of Education. But this year, it's going to Paula Forbes, who oh, has wow. been a uh, consultant to the Hopkins School District was really instrumental in putting together the whole reimagine Minnesota process and uh, results that we got. And I can't think of anyone more deserving than Paula Forbes. So you can you can watch it on uh, streaming online next 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 Friday, first Friday of the of November. Absolutely. She'll be receiving the award. Wonderful choice. Yeah. That's great. So. Thank you. So we do not have any community members here to pu <laughs> publicly comment. That's easy for me to say. Publicly <laughs> comment on items not on the agenda. So we will move to our final agenda item. And I would look for a motion to adjourn. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion carries this meeting of the